Right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I am Hans. I am privileged to host this excellent debate between these two fine individuals uh, who will now introduce themselves. Uh, Demon Mama, Connor, uh, whoever wants to go first, go ahead. Go for okay, it. Okay, fine. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Connor. I run a YouTube channel named Counterpoints. I identify as centrist or center right. I am a statist. Uh, probably a civic nationalist, so that'll be good for the uh, first beginning uh, section of this debate. And yeah, so I have some uh, shitty Chud right wing positions, and I'm sure we'll uncover them as we get through the debate. And uh, if you want to check out anything, I'm a Marine veteran, law enforcement veteran, and a science fiction, politics, philosophy, and religious nerd. So if any of that interests you, go into YouTube, type in counterpoints, common spelling, and chances are you can find me. We're about to, we're probably going to break 8K. Uh, in the next uh, few weeks, maybe maybe a little bit longer, maybe a bit, a little bit less, and that's me. Let's go, big pog. Demon Mama. Hello, everyone. My name is Demon Mama. Um, you can find me at demonmama.com forward slash live if you want to watch the live stream. The standard demonmama.com if you want to find all of my links. Um, I do a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, one of which is debates. Um, and I was wondering, Hans, if you are all right, if we could do a little, uh, a little different, uh. Uh, what's the term here? Curveball. And I would like to say some nice things about Connor. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about toxicity in the debate space. And I just want to say, uh, uh, you don't have to return the favor if you don't want to, Connor. I don't want to obli like oblige you into saying nice things about me. But I did want to take the opportunity to say, I really respect that you were willing to do this. And congratulations on winning our previous, um, our previous bet. Um, because, uh, you know... <laughs> Uh, like I said, I like to keep things honest. Uh, I did three minutes more than you, so congratulations. But honestly, I've, I've really enjoyed. Even though we, could you give a little more? Could you give a little more background on like that's part? That's almost like why we're here, like in the first place. So like, what was that the debate debacle again? Like you were like a uh, had an argument over who was talking more during a prime panel or something. Like yeah. That? Like, so was... there's been a um, there's been a recurring thing in uh, in my panel experiences over the years, which is that. Um, uh, is that I, I, I get told that I talk a, a lot, like a lot, like every single debate, people be like, oh, you talk so much, you talk so much. And um, while I am verbose, I don't think that it's so much that it deserves being called out all the time. Um, and one time, uh, Connor did it, and I got really mad, and I said, you know what, let's fucking bet. And he was right. I talked three minutes more than him. Um, and so I paid up. Hold on. There's a little bit more lore to this, which was this is the second time this happened. So the first time... I was completely caught flat footed because like I was confident. I was like, I don't know, but I was so caught off by the question that I was just like, ah, <laughs> and like, and so as a result, I just shut the fuck up. Cause I was like, I don't know who talked more. Um, and then as a result, uh, basically it was, it was a little bit shit posty of me, but it did seem like I was getting less time than uh, most people in general for the first two subjects when we first uh, took that bet. Um, and so, and so basically I was like, I am absolutely confident this time. So, you know, you call me out and I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm going to take that bet. You showed me up last time. I'm going to catch you this time. <laughs> so, yeah. The previous times, uh, the previous too. times I've been challenged on this was, um, uh, uh, fanatic once said that, and we, we actually did the timings and it turns out fanatic talked way more than me, despite screaming about how all I do is talk. He actually got me mixed up with somebody else on the panel, which, you know, but whatever, uh, so anyway, that's the, the context for it. But I just want to say that even though Connor and I have had a history of, of, of bouts and some spice, uh, I really respect Connor a lot, and I'm really happy that we're here to discuss this today. I'm looking forward to us having a uh, a, a, a chess timer debate for the ages. No, it's a... It, and and I'll, I'll reciprocate. Uh, basically, we could have had the same shit posty asshole fucking toxic relationship that all of Twitter and Twitch is based upon, um, I think that uh, we both backed off and kind of took a step back a little bit, maybe, you know, to, to assess the toxicity. I'm not going to try to break that streak anytime soon at all, ever, if we can if we can avoid it. Um, so hopefully we can be assholes to each other in a way that feels fun instead of assholes to each other in a way that feels toxic. And that that would be my goal for our relationship is we can still be spicy. We can still be a little bit mean sometimes, but... Uh, it should be playful, not cruel, and yeah. that—that's kind of where I want to go. Me too, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm—I'm glad that that there is more people who share that that goal because you know I'm I'm spicy, but I really do try to keep it. Uh, I try to keep it contained to the debate itself and not turn into some sort of like huge grudge fest. And there's a lot of blood. I know there's a lot of bad blood on this side of Twitch in some places, but I don't know. I I appreciate the fact that we've been able to have a lot of good conversations. 
Take cool. All. all right. With all of the niceties uh, out of the way, um, I'm just going to reread uh, the rules for everyone on the panel and everyone listening real quick. So, um, I'm, I'll, I'll give each of you a two-minute opener that is not part of your 30 minutes, uh, just to define your position on the topic, so hopefully we can have a more constructive, uh, non strawmanning conversation. I don't think either of you are going to do that, but like having a positive position that both of you affirm, uh, so we can have a better conversation, I feel like is a great way to get it started. Um, I'm really only going to be managing the chess timer. Um, uh, both of you on my, uh, like my other panels, um, it's much more regulated, but with only two of you, I don't really see a point in like making you raise your hand and like go back and forth between the two of you. That seems really, really dumb. Uh, so we're not going to do that. Um, in terms of interruptions, if one of you is speaking and the other one interrupts them, I will switch the timer to the interruptee because hopefully like to encourage like respecting each other's speaking time. Because again, both of you only have 30 minutes, which feels like a lot, but I feel like it's going to go away very, very quickly. Um, if it keeps going on for a really long period of time, I will jump in just to stop it. I will pause the timer so none of you have any time, and then I'll throw it back to one of you, and then we can keep going uh, so that, just to make sure that we uh, keep everything in order. I'll remind both of you at 20, 10, uh, 5, and 1 minute remaining uh, of your time. Uh, otherwise, you're welcome to like either... I did, Mama. I know you said you can't uh, look at Discord, so uh, you're welcome to either look at like on my di on my stream or anything like that, like in a demo tab, uh, if you want to look at that. And uh, if so, once one of you uh, finishes, once one of you loses your 30 minutes, the other per uh, I will mute that person, and the other person has a uh, time to do a closing statement on the topic uh, for however much time they have left. If Connor uh, goes out of time and Diva Mama has 34, I'm sorry, three minutes and 40 seconds, she's welcome to use all of that time. And any time she doesn't use, we will transfer uh, to the nearest minute to the next uh, debate. So that means if Dima only has like a 40 minute closing statement or a 40 second closing statement, it means she gets 33 minutes for the second topic of the debate night. So do all of you understand the rules? Absolutely. Yes. Our, and then are we running like two subjects for an hour each, two subjects for a half hour each, one subject for an hour? So uh, yes. Uh, so you each get 30 minutes uh, for each topic for the two topics. So each uh, topic discussion should be about an hour. So one hour for, for anarchism versus nationalism, one uh, topic for the environmentalism. Uh, conversation. So, uh, which one of you would like to go first for the two-minute opening statement of your position? I mean, I can open first if you'd like. Yeah, All that'd be right. great. Uh, DM Mom will go first for this one, and then uh, Connor can go first uh, for the second topic. So, uh, DM Mama, uh, two minutes on the clock. Uh, go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, people approach anarchism from a lot of different perspectives, and it is in the uh, it is in America a a rather misunderstood um, ideology and belief system. So, I'm going to start this off by uh, quote-mongering just a little bit. I'm going to read a quote from the, um, the well-respected anarchist philosopher Errico Malatesta. Anarchists believe in a world where o the only coercion is the coercion of nature itself and its limitations. Anarchism represents a worldview, practice, and creed focused on removing coercive domination and exploitation from our, pr our political lives and our personal lives to the best, of our to the best degree possible. Anarchism is fundamentally concerned with the liberation of individuals and communities from the fetters of oppressive rule, exploitation, and coercive domination. This is a struggle that takes many forms and find itself, it finds itself in opposition to centralized worldviews such as nationalism. While nationalism offers a tempting illusion for some, a central construct by which all individuals can unite themselves into a single mighty force, um, it often, the actual way that it plays out is that people chain themselves to this, uh, to this, um, construct, this construct that is often manned by um, a group of individuals or a single individual who ultimately make the decisions of those people's lives. Um, the strength that comes from it is often used to pit it against other such constructs, other nations. Um, and I think that the one of the best uh, examples of how of this is 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 the world wars. Both world wars represented constructs of individuals. Um, uh, the individuals lining up behind constructs and throwing at one another uh, a nearly identical other construct that also centered around uh, a nation. In my opinion, nationalism does not address the problems of the modern world. We cannot uh, solve global warming with, uh, with nationalism. We cannot solve war with nationalism. We cannot solve nuclear armament with nationalism. However, anarchism an ideology that focuses on liberation of communities and individuals offers us answers in a world that is growing and evolving. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Demon Mama. I didn't want to cut you off. Uh, you have to uh, two minutes and 12 seconds, so I'm going to give Connor uh, the same uh, blessing. Uh, so thank you for your opening statement. All right, Connor, uh, two minutes and 12 seconds on the clock. Uh, go ahead, buddy. 
Yeah, so I think that nation states are necessary from a geopolitical mindset to administer uh, certain uh, essential state functions. I think they're also necessary for a geopolitical purpose. I think there's certain regions that basically make sense from a uh, geopolitical administration level. I think uh, North America makes a certain amount of sense. I think South uh, South America makes a certain amount of sense, Central America. They, there's geographic things that basically determine areas, language groups, ethnicities, and I, I think tribalism in general is pretty inherent to the human experience. Um, I am a uh, like a civic nationalist, which means that I think that there's civic virtues that are important. And I think that emphasizing those virtues in a nation state and also uh, promoting it worldwide is important. I believe in liberal democracy. I believe in individual freedom. I believe in republicanism. I believe in constitutionalism, not just because I was raised with these ideas, but because I've looked at the competitors and I think that the competitors are far and away worse. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, I think these values need to be promoted and uh, vol voluntarism or voluntarism can only get you so far. Um, there is not. There are some things that are not capable of being administered by voluntary commitment. I think that uh, food is something that probably can't be uh, guaranteed in any kind of way through voluntary commitment. I think security is not something that can be uh, secured voluntarily. I think that uh, medicine, uh, doctors, is not something that can be secured voluntarily. And basically, if we want to promote these structures uh, in a healthy and happy way, then we need a state in order to administer those functions. Um, you did bring up an interesting point where they're uh, basically nationalism is chaining yourself to a construct and then fighting other constructs. I think that's completely true. Um, but I think the virtues of these constructs is interesting and necessary. So I would not, I would, um, while acknowledging the crimes of the United States of America and the Western world, I would uh, delineate from a strong moral stance authoritarian communism or uh, basically German fascism or neo-imperial Japanese fascism. I think there are stark differences in their opinions. Um, let me know if I'm running out of time. And then I, I guess, yeah, I'll just leave the rest for uh, the general. So the rest of it is just response. So I'll leave it for the general. All right. So uh, just so you both know, uh, my third screen that I have the timer on is over there. So if I doesn't look like I'm looking at either of you, it's because I'm trying to make sure that I'm like doing it as uh, perfectly as possible for the changes. So uh, both of you have done your opening statements uh, with all the time uh, on the clock for each of you, 30 minutes and everyone can see it. Uh, feel free to start going. Sure. Uh, one of the things I would like to point out immediately um, in Connor's statement was this this. Um, sort of appeal to the necessity. Um, this is something that states often do. They appeal to their own necessity, um, which is only necessitated because of other states that are doing the exact same thing with the exact same justification. This leads to these sort of senseless wars that we see in, uh, in that were characterized by World War I, World War II, where hyper-nationalistic powers um, both were looking to expand their colonial gains, were both looking to expand their borders and encroached on other people, leading to a perceived necessity for a strong state to get everybody together and go kill each other. And that seems to be the main purpose of nationalism. Nationalism seems to have grown out of um, monarchism. And interestingly, nationalism uh, just doesn't seem to be holding up particularly well. If you look at the most nationalist countries in the world, they were not able to respond well to a global pandemic that required cooperation. Um, and this goes, I think this has a certain amount of a trickle down effect from countries that, that are enforced about nationalism and their national superiority um, often end up engaging and instilling their citizens with ideas that are anti-social and anti-human. Uh, a couple of examples of this. We have uh, here in America, a hyper-nationalist Donald Trump um, got uh, well over 600,000 Americans killed by neglectfully um, engaging with the pandemic. In Brazil, um, a nationalist got, let me just see here, uh, the numbers are shocking in Brazil. Uh, they have cases, 19.4 million oh, cases with 544. Demon mama, I, yeah, Demon I can't mama. hear you. Oh, one second. Uh, oh, my apologies. A uh, small glitch on my uh, my Discord froze for a second. Um, uh, I heard uh, Brazil was nationalistic. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, uh, Brazil uh, is, is led by, of course, a hyper-nationalist, Jair Bolsonaro, um, who, uh, whose deaths, uh, COVID deaths are in the are in the range of 550,000. Likewise, India, a hyper-nationalist country, which is currently um, under um, undertaking a, a, a genocide and imprisonment of its uh, Kashmiri population on nationalistic grounds, um, uh, also has had 418,000 deaths um, and 31 million cases. Nationalist countries have done a terrible job adapting to the 20th, to the 21st century, let alone the 21st century. And the nationalist, the great acts of nationalism 
that we have to look at over the last century are, of course, World War I and World War II, the invasion, uh, the invasions by Imperial Japan, nationalism, oh, and of course, the uh, atrocities carried out by the USSR. Um, nationalism is a, is a worldview that encourages this I, sort of inherent idea of, super, of supremacy, and it is, uh, it is sort of the foundations of it are built on the idea that such evils are necessary to keep us safe, necessary to keep us safe. Well, I mean, let's take a look at post 9-11 to see all these things that are so-called necessary to keep us safe, and we realize those things aren't really so necessary, are they? Okay. Um... All right, so I'll begin by basically uh, responding to your your issue so far, and then I'll try to double back to some things that I heard you say in your opening. Um, so the appeal to the ne uh, to the necessity. This is something that you started with and you you ended with. I think it's absolutely true. Um, so uh, it's not just other rival states; it's also other competing organizations that crave power. Not everybody is an anarchist. Not everybody is a libertarian. Not everybody is a liberal. Not everybody is live and let live. Um, our world is actually chock full of authoritarians uh religious and political mm -hmm. and some of those people basically no, no offense but like uh some people who fight for those ideologies have to be killed in order to be convinced that their ideologies aren't correct so uh with that being said you know jihadist terrorists being a prime example you were saying that uh you know the post 9 11 security apparatus and um you know basically is self-justifying and we don't know whether or not it was necessary and all this kind of stuff well i mean that's easy to say from a younger perspective, from my perspective, I saw 3,000 people murdered on live television and I saw billions of dollars of property damage in a single day. It took like one hour in order to achieve that. So if that's the kind of thing that's possible, not even from a nationalist force, but from like a non-nationalist force, then yeah, you're goddamn right we need a fucking security apparatus. Um, when it comes to senseless wars, I understand that you say that the instigators could be senseless in their motivations and that it was ultra-nationalism that drove them to do so. I would say the resistance to those ultra-nationalist instigators is something that was completely necessary and was absolutely necessary um, within the context of people resisting, whether you're talking about Great Britain, uh, the fr French paramilitaries. If you wanted to uh, use a classical definition for Jewish people and say that, you know, the, the, the nation of Israel or the nation of, uh, you know, Jewish folk basically needed to resist Nazi Germany, I think there's absolutely um, a just cause for re uh, resisting nationalist and post-nationalist forces. And also, like, laying uh, conflict at the hands of, like, nationalism purely is a little bit weird when you study history, because, for instance, are we going to consider, like, Genghis Khan a nationalist force? Um, I mean, we could make arguments for Imperial uh, China, we could make arguments for all that kind of stuff, but like, are we gonna are we gonna make these same arguments for pre-national tribalistic forces? I see nationalism as a balance of power game in which states lean into each other, and strong states know that they can't take each other out. I also view this game that you're saying is kind of like silly or whatever. I only see it as like possible to not engage in this game once everybody lays down their swords, which nobody is going to do. So uh, that that's kind of where I'm at. Where like, yeah, sure. In every in the world where everybody is an anarchist, anarchism is possible. But not everybody's going to be an anarchist. Therefore, anarchism is not possible. Yield. Um, again, I think this comes from a sort of basic understanding of what anarchism is attempting to uh, accomplish. Um, I think some people look at anarchism through a, a the lens of of like authoritarian revolutionary movements. And that doesn't really map well to anarchism. Anarchists don't really believe that there's going to be some big singular rev revolution that's going to change the entire world um, into into like an anarchist uh, utopia. Instead, they believe in crafting functional societies that are able to resist unjust domination through numerous means. Sometimes that does involve warfare and that does involve uh, voluntary participation in warfare, which people will voluntarily engage in if they are threatened by a larger uh, state, but there are other such, um, or by a, by a state, there are there are other such um, structure or other such uh, responses to this that don't involve violence or even uh, what we would consider um, sort of revolution in the like Marxist Leninist sense, where it's like you get a bunch of workers together and give them guns. No, um, in fact, all across Africa, for example, there are a number of currently self-identifying um, nationalists or not nationalist. Um, anarchist uh, factions that have been able to avoid uh, falling under the rule of of warlords of, of, of colonial states by simply being embracing uh, a nomadic lifestyle or by uh, embracing a 
um, a independent lifestyle where they produce their own food. Now, this isn't the same solution for everyone. However, it is something that deserves to be looked at. Now, I'll notice that uh, I'll, I'll point out that like when you talk about 9-11, um, our security apparatus didn't prevent or save us from not future 9-11s. The statistics on, on our security apparatus's ability to thwart terroristic attacks is terrible. And if you look at the source of what caused 9-11, which is undoubtedly a tragedy. Also, I know, uh, I know I'm, I'm, I'm younger than you, but I, I literally watch it on TV as well. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm 30, I'm only 30. So, you know, but, uh, uh, and I remember how horrifying it was. It was horrifying. But the cause, the cause of something like that was very much the fault of the state. Our tampering in other countries has built up a level of hatred for our state that results in these types of things. And it is unfortunate that because of the way these things work out, that citizens pay the price. But that is ultimately the meddling of the state and then the state saying, look, these people are attacking us. They're justifying their own existence by going and destabilizing countries and then engaging in warfare and engaging in, in the, the restriction of freedoms of its own people in the name of justifying its own existence. This is something that states do all the time. They justify their own existence by causing the very crises that they need to respond to. And I think that there is a very valid critique on that when it comes to 9-11, but not just 9-11. Um, our country creates all kinds of crises that it then justifies. It says, oh, no, the state must be here to take care of it, the very problems that they created. Um, as for the idea that like medicine or, or food cannot be handled without some sort of central national authority, I strongly disagree with you. Um, there are numerous, even here in America, uh, the idea that like food is controlled on a federal level is, is, um, is, quite, is quite new. Medicine as well. There are all kinds of people um, who more than willingly in become like a doctor. The idea that humans are just like all lazy layabouts by default um, is, is just flown in the face of by, by so much. There's so much data that goes against this. And I think it's an appeal to the idea that humans are by nature some, some somewhat selfish. And I don't think that humans are by nature somewhat selfish. I think that humans are social by nature. I think that humans, and if you look at history, yes, while there is war and, and strife through all of human history, there's a whole lot more cooperation throughout history. And I think that's true here as well. Humans aren't layabouts. Humans are passionate. They care about their communities. They care about their family members. And they will voluntarily do wonderful and amazing things. If you need a, a current example of this, I recommend looking at uh, the open source and modding communities. Uh, game, you know, the modding community in games is a little bit more frivolous. The open source community is not. We are only able to do this right now because of a fundamentally um, anarchistic structure, open source software, OBS, the 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 it, the technology that that makes all of this possible for us to be talking here right now was built on open source principles of voluntary participation, voluntary donation. And that shows that people can and do. They are inspired by this. Beating people to do things, um, threatening people with imprisonment and war does not work. It <coughs> discourages people and it encourages them to engage in other deleterious behavior. Damn, you give me a lot. So. All right, so I just want to double back to um, the original statements and then kind of flow through what we just talked about right now. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the one of the most interesting things that you said uh, for the opening when you were quoting that uh, anarchist philosopher was basically the coercion of nature. Mm -hmm. um, I actually view that as one of the primary driving forces of like human behavior and even of the state itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, like I think that the way that bees form colonies or beavers build dams or something like that, I don't view uh, human creation or human industry as some kind of like uh, some some step above nature. I view it as the continuation of nature. I don't think we're above it. I think we're a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that oftentimes that like that natural those natural needs are what drive us to do what we do, including our social structures and including the formation of states. Um, I think states are just they're basically administrative bodies created by people in order to wield almost unimaginable power because we have more power now than we've ever had in the entirety of history. Um, you brought up global warming. Mm -hmm. We're possibly destroying our planet right now just through industry. Um, I don't think we were ready to wield that kind of power. Nuclear power, I know we weren't ready to wield that. Uh, war uh, war used to be 20 guys, uh, you know, showing up to fight 20 guys and then chucking a spear at each other. And then one person dies and then they go back and get drunk and have a ceremony and talk, uh, talk shit about how fucking brave they were during the battle. Now it's machine gunning tens of thousands of people to death in like a matter of days. So, yeah, like war is another power that human beings have not figured out how to wield properly. 
Another thing that you said that was really interesting was crafting functional societies parallel to the state, hopefully to end the state, uh, whether that was like food security, security in general, or uh, society in general, um, you know, like the, these nomadic tribes that are kind of like, uh, they, they've created their own voluntary power structure uh, parallel to the state, and as a result, the state could dissolve. That is the only way that I see this happening, and frankly, uh, I'm a little bit more pessimistic about the nature of human beings, uh, probably because I'm on Twitter.com. Um, so, so that'll like, do it. That'll do you it. You got me there. <laughs> so the, but but that that's what I mean is like I don't trust the average pe uh, person or the average democratic person with like uh, peer levels of power with everybody around them to be able to handle food security, uh, social lives, ego, industry, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I don't want to bypass your nine eleven um, comments, but I, I kind of want to root you in why I think they're so important. Um, I think that like energy, um, energy very specifically is something that like it cannot be ignored in this conversation, because when you look at the actions of states within the 20th century, it's almost all about energy, mm -hmm. whether we're talking about like mm -hmm. nuclear, uh, military machines, oil, natural gas, all that kind of stuff. Nearly everything uh, we do is around energy. And a lot of people uh, use that as a moment to scoff where they go, oh, <laughs> you only fight for material reasons. It's like. Nah, material reasons are pretty much the main reasons that you fucking fight for. And on top of that, uh, you know, uh, quoting Dune, who controls the spice, controls, you know, destiny or future or whatever the fuck. I haven't read Dune yet. Um, but, but the fucking point is, <laughs> it's all right, we'll work on it. Um, but the point is that controlling oil or controlling energy is not a, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a simple thing. And it's not something that I think could be done completely voluntarily. I'll be happy to hear your rebuttal to that. Um, and then when we're talking about like food can't be or can be handled by a not a decentralized authority, mm -hmm. um, my fear with um, medicine um, and food mm -hmm. and security is that these things, when left up to the voluntary, will be done by a very select few people. And the demands of society are going to be a lot higher than the people who are willing to risk their lives for security, the people who are willing to spend hours toiling in order to guarantee food, or the people who are the people who are even capable of administering medicine in a responsible way. I don't even think that society is capable of generating enough people in order to do that and that we have to have social structures that generate these people, that culturally pressure these people, that materially reward these people mm -hmm. in order to go into these vocations because on a purely voluntary society in which uh, everybody just gets the same thing or approximately the same thing, I don't think these volunteers are going to show up. Um, okay, so there's a couple of things I could talk about there. So first of all, I think that um, reality disagrees with you with regard to these people showing up. I think that a lot of people who are financially secure, um, we see this in our country, a lot of people who are financially secure pursue more frequently um, advanced education because they don't have to be forced into doing um, manual labor jobs that are largely not um, necessary. I make jokes about the Funko Pops all the time, but I mean, let's be real. There are th hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of fucking Funko Pops that people had to labor and die to make, and they're just going to rot in a in a uh, in a uh, pile of of uh, of garbage. And and that's not to say that there isn't room for certain luxury goods, but we can acknowledge that this hyper centralized, hyper corporate influenced. Um, uh, process has had more in impacts than we like to admit sometimes. Um, there's the joke about uh, how, you know, in America, you get a choice of a hundred different nearly identical products, all of which basically uh, taste exactly the same and do the exact same thing. Very, very wasteful. Um, and this is a product of this type of, of hyper-nationalism, this idea that um, that you can basically do anything to forward the state. Think about how America's agricultural situation has been converted entirely to corn production because of subsidies by the state. It is can convenient. I, can I ask you a question though? Sure, sure. Very, very specific. Um, so you were you were bringing up like Funko prop production. You were bringing up how the United States or, or capitalist countries in general, or or, or just. I don't know. Yeah, I guess capitalist countries in general mm -hmm. um, produce like different iterations of the same product that they virtually do all the same thing. And it's wasteful. Um, how in a voluntary society would you compel people to be efficient with the distribution of resources if everybody is free to do what they want? Why wouldn't like, you know, people basically, uh, you know, buy 3D printers and create their own intellectual property version of the Funko Pop and just, uh, you know, thank you very much for the rain. Of plastic bullshit. To thank throw you so much. Stay here. Uh, sorry, I just got a, a big raid. I apologize for uh, being a little bit uh, expressive there. I just got a, a large raid. So, uh, no, thank no you. Uh, if, if, if you want to address that, I can pause it. Uh, for, yeah, for can you bit. just pause the time so I can welcome it in and be polite? 
Of course. Thank you very much, the serfs, for the raid. Please come and get comfortable. We are discussing um we are discussing yeah. anarchism uh, versus nationalism and then, uh, and then connor um and I have, uh, uh i love I you all to, like, come get comfy come enough, to the website demamama.com so, um i'm gonna let it run on your end for about 10 seconds just to even it back out yeah sure okay um the i i welcomed everybody in so um here's the thing um the idea that like people need to be forced uh into um like so you, you know, there's a bit of a hypocrisy in your argument you you argued that natural like this sort of um these natural dangers that Malatesta brought up are, are the reason why people um, do lots of things. Well, guess what? Those still exist. We don't need to force people to do things for a state, a state which declares, oh, yes, this is the thing you must do. Ah, yes, we are going to give you more money, which you desperately need so that you don't starve, um, to grow corn, which won't be useful for you or your community or even our country because we want to export corn or because we have a, a byproduct of corn that's needed to advance our economic goals. We recognize that the American people have been crushed beneath the economic decisions of the of the American state. And this is an issue. The issue is that the state convinces people to do things that are out of their interest and then forces them to do things that are out of their interest. People have a desire to provide for their community, to provide for their family members, to provide for the people that they love. Now, of course, there might be a handful of random layabouts or people who like are like really not into doing whatever but the idea that that's most people is just simply not true most people the average american is hard working they go to work even if they don't fully understand the reason why they're doing it and they do that because they care about their community because they care about their family these motivations have been well documented throughout history humans are not layabouts humans love doing stuff and again i i give you an example of this um twitch twitch politics is a very Oddly enough, anarchic space. Although there's all kinds of tampering, we all come together and we find these shows out of our mutual self-interest. You, me, and Hans aren't being forced to do any of this. In fact, we're doing this willingly and joyfully to hundreds of people who are willingly, joyfully, and voluntarily watching our show. This applies all over the place. In fact, I can think of, in fact, I have studies to back this up. One of the things that I always point to when I'm talking to usually um, statist um, you know, communists is the idea that hu that humans actually do a better job um, when they are appreciated at their workplace even more than when they're paid more at their workplace. Pay Workers who are regularly uh, who are regularly aware of the impact that their work is doing, and this goes all the way up to doctors, by the way, when they're aware that they're having a positive influence on their community, they are so much more likely. I'm talking. I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but they are ridiculously more likely to report positive job satisfaction even when they're paid less. And that's because people, as it turns out, humans really like to see the fruits of our labor. We really like to know that we're helping the people around us, the people that we know and that we see. This is something that Marx talks about with regard to um, alienation, although that concept is a lot bigger. The idea that we're alienated from the products of our labor, that we don't know where it goes or what happens to it, is a huge problem in this current um, malaise. People love to work. People put so much work into, again, game mods is the best one, oh. something completely frivolous that people will work for years on just because they're passionate about that thing. So I would argue that a voluntary world is much more possible than you than many people believe, and that the state largely argues that people are lazy layabouts to justify why they cave your head in with a stick when you don't do what they want you to do, which largely enriches a handful of uh, politicians and and corporate leaders, um, you know, at the at the the, the uh, damage of America. And not to go on a huge rant, I know I'm probably using quite a lot of my time, but I think this is important. If you look at the way that rural America has unfolded over the last century, rural America is now largely a bunch of copy and paste towns with a McDonald's, a Walmart, a Target, etc. These towns have none of the culture and none of the satisfaction, none of the communities that they used to have because they've been hollowed out in the name of forwarding the uh, the the well uh, economic well-being of an imaginary construct. An imaginary construct who could be controlled by Donald Trump or could be controlled by somebody else. But again, it is a construct that people are chained to and convinced that they need when they don't. All right. Uh, uh, right before uh, Connor responds, uh, Dean Mama, I just want to let you know that you passed 20 minutes and you now have 17 minutes and 12 seconds left on the clock on your end. So, uh, Connor, go ahead in your response. Yeah, so um, I'm a little confused, but I'm sure you can elucidate and uh, clarify it for me. So one of the arguments that you made was state subsidization. Uh, state subsidization. Holy shit, that's a fucking mouthful. Um, is inefficient. Um, I get that. 
but at the same time, what I asked you earlier that I, I would like you to respond to mm -hmm. is basically when everything is voluntary, when there's no compulsion, when there's, um, you know, basically nobody forcing you to do anything, mm -hmm. um, what's preventing you from creating, you know, uh, 3D printed IP violating uh, Funko Pops endlessly and selling them on Etsy to nobody's benefit whatsoever, creating more trash than even our current market economy does? What's to prevent people from basically engaging in this voluntary behavior? And I'll, I'll bring up another historical example because you brought up, I, I'll let you respond, but just let me bring up another example. Um, so for instance, you were saying that humans are motivated primarily in their self-interest, but also in the interests of their family and the interests of their community. Mm -hmm. What I would say is in the 19th century, you're absolutely fucking right. And this caused an ecological disaster. There were cash crops, basically crops that, uh, you know, the, the farmers wanted to grow because they knew it was their most lucrative thing in order to grow. As a result, they didn't do crop rotation. They depleted the soil, uh, the soil richness inside the earth. And then as a result, they basically created an ecological catastrophe because they were acting what they thought was in their interest and in their, you know, their community's interest and in their family's interest. And what it actually took in order to get people to stop doing this shit was like federal level intervention saying no motherfuckers you can't grow whatever you want you got to rotate crops you have to adopt these best practices or else you're literally going to destroy your own ability to fucking exist i can leave it there if you want to respond to that yeah i can respond to a oh, couple and, of this so uh you're welcome to um and maybe uh this might help in terms of like steering the conversation if you're gonna like uh instead of like having like longer uh like periods of speaking if you're gonna like uh, and then one like maybe like ask like a question the other one has to respond to again it might be better if we like try and follow this point by point, uh, just to mm -hmm. make sure that you're able to adequately respond to each other, uh, just to make sure that the time disparity doesn't like get too uh, cre uh, crazy on one. Unless Connor's that that's Connor's strategy. That that was that was my strategy, Hans. Oh oh oh, oh <laughs> no! I, I, like, nothing gets past me. I fucking see you. But like, uh, but but, 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 but however, uh, if both of you want to handle this, uh, feel free to do it in any way that you want. Nah, no, I'm I'm okay if we if we want to be more so you know like sober and attentive to it. Um, because I want to entertain the audience too, but that that's where I would say that sometimes uh, voluntary individuals acting in quote unquote their best interest, sometimes they don't know what their best interest is. Sometimes they make horrific mistakes. Yes, but I mean, but that's that's that is also true about large central figures. I mean, we all know a thousand stories about corporations making absolutely asinine decisions in order to make a quick buck for a couple people at the top. And I would argue that a couple of people. Um, making the wrong decision about their own local community. I don't know. There's some things that you could say that are very hard to predict, whatever. I think that the damage of that is significantly less and can be alleviated much easier than the types of mistakes that we see with regard to massive corporations or states imposing enormous ecological damage. Uh, I mean, I could go into, I could talk about oil spills. I could talk about all of these decisions and mistakes but that are made by large organizations and because mm -hmm. they have the power to do so because they have the unmitigated in many cases power to engage in these things they can do incredible harm on a scale that's hard for us to even comprehend destroying entire environments this is why these topics i think are very is this good. is this like is this like post money though does no money no no, 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 no. Is there i'm a not universal arguing, currency i'm what, not arguing what's kinda... hold on i'm not arguing about a utopia i'm arguing about the principles of mm -hmm. anarchism that we can put into effect right now and the things that we should aim to do right now i don't believe that there's okay. a lot of useful conversation to be had around perfect um, utopian societies. I don't think that we're ever going to have like a utopian society. However, I think that um, uh, America could use a healthy dose of anarchist thinking in, in, in revolutionizing the way that we look, especially as climate change comes on. So to address the Funko Pop thing, first of all, based, if, you, if you're if you 3D printing your own Funko Pops and violating IP law, look, I don't endorse any violations of any law whatsoever, but I think it's super cool if you're making art that's improved and, and, and under your own control. If you decide to sell those on Etsy, that's great. If people have a really want that thing, they're going to buy it. What stops them from flooding the market? Well, what stops them from flooding the market is that nobody will buy it. See, that's the problem. When you have a company like, when you have companies like these Funko Pop companies that are subsidiaries of, of another massive company, they can sit there and float and produce these, these manufactured f fads that, that just waste resources and waste everyone's time, low product quality, horrible work conditions for the people producing them, and they are inventing the demand. The demand, the demand for all kinds of art and interesting products exists already, and we can sort that out among ourselves. If there's somebody who's really saying like, oh, wow, I would love for a bunch of cute dolls, people will make those. They don't have to be done from some centralized, again, they don't have to be done on some, on some sort of centralized focus in the name of the economy where everybody has to go, well, why do I live in a copy-paste town and all of our local culture has been cr crushed and erased? 
um, so that we can what? So that I can vaguely justify that our shops will be full of Funko Pops? This is the sort of alienation that, again, once again, that I mentioned that Marx talked about, where people don't even know what they're building anymore or why, and they're told they have to do it or else they starve. Um, and they never get to, to find out why that's the case. I think, uh, and with well, regard in to- a, In a capitalist system, <clears throat> some dumb fuck has to be buying them, right? Well, no, actually. Um, there's all kinds of products that get um, that get inflated for no reason. Now, certainly there's some demand for Funko Pops, but if you go out to a mall, you're going to find five stores that are wall-to-wall -wall stacked with Funko Pops and their back their back rooms are full of Funko <laughs> Pops as well. Do we have to keep it on the Funko Pops? Yeah, metaphor? yeah, I think Funko well, Pops... I mean, I guess... I find Funko it's Pops... It's a powerful be, one because it's, it's a stupid fucking product Yeah, they're product really stupid. I'm not going to defend. They're, but but, 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 at the same time, but, like, that, it, but there's, is, there's a million of again. those. There's a million of those. That's everything. That's okay. so many of these things. The thing is that guess what? There is a demand for delicious soda. Soda. I love soda. I fucking love soda. Guess what? Somebody in my town could start making... In fact, I buy local soda all the time. A local soda producer could buy, could set up a, a co-op owned um, soda production house and there would well, be okay, a crazy so, so demand I have for that. A, I have a question for you because I, I think I actually need to shift my frame a little bit because because basically I think I'm arguing against and trying to poke holes in like a utopian and uh, anarchic future mm -hmm. in which uh, basically like, you know, anarchists have uh, propagandized society so fucking well that we've created parallel structures. There's no need for the state anymore. You just completely dissolve like 70% of the- just, 70% of the population are anarchists. They want to create their own parallel societies and feed each other's needs and think communally and all that kind of shit. Um, so the state just like withers away and dies. And then I'm trying to poke like bullshit in there for like basically the 30% of tribalistic dickheads that are going to ruin it for everybody because they're not going to think communally oh, or they're going to have uh, can well, I, can hold I on one second. Because because here's the thing is ultimately I think what you're arguing for weirdly enough uh, would be in line with a lot of libertarian thinking. Uh, weirdly enough, you I know CTV is an off-putting character, um, but CTV would probably, I agree with you on like 70% of the shit where it's like, yo, fuck the state, mm -hmm. fuck central government, mm -hmm. uh, people should be looking after themselves, we shouldn't be waiting for Uncle Sam to come save us for our own from our own problems, we should be thinking locally, we should be acting locally, we should be taking care of our people, we should be taking care of this, taking care of that, and if we're looking to uh, the state to ban fossil fuels and do this, that, the other then um then basically one it's either not going to happen or it's not going to happen the way that we want it to and then two on top of that you're at the complete mercy and whim of other people this is actually perfectly in line with libertarian thinking okay the, well, the wait, problem... wait, there's a couple things there i want to i really want to address because there was a couple things you brought up can i address a couple of those sure okay yeah, so please. first of one all one second well, uh, sorry well, one second before you do i uh, just letting uh, connor know uh, connor uh you passed 20 minutes uh, a while ago but you were talking i didn't want to interrupt you uh, you're at 18 minutes and six seconds now so uh, go ahead even while Cool. Okay, yeah. So to address a couple of the things that you brought up, first of all, yes, uh, there are libertarians who will claim to have the same views as me, and then when you listen to their um, to their actual prescriptions for society, they actually do not support any of the libertarian things they do. This is this is categorical of both ANCAPs and the Libertarian Party in the United States, which is ANCAPs are not anarchists in in almost any way that you can imagine. They only have the most surface level. Um, aesthetic appeals. Likewise goes for American libertarians. They say they want a small state, but they regularly vote to empower the state to the greatest degree in the most violent way possible. Notice how um, uh, people like CTV, not to rag on somebody who's not here, but CTV will advocate for an incredibly strong military, the military that basically makes it impossible um, for uh, people to uh, you know exist in peace around the world. Um, but So that's one thing that I can address. And then uh, the other thing that I wanted to um, address was this... Um, a crud. I lost what, what the other... What was the first thing that you said in that in that particular... I don't know. I have early onset Alzheimer's. Um, but, the, but, but, I, but I actually did have a, another oh, question, oh. and I, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to escape. No, if, you ha if you have it, go for it. Uh, it's just a quick one that I didn't get to address before. With regard to cash crops, cash crops are a product of the very thing that I described before. Cash crops exist because of the need for uh, an engagement in, in corporate trade that demands an incredible and unfathomable amount of tobacco, not locally sourced tobacco that you can enjoy and share with your community, not weed that you can do, but instead this, this abstract ghost of an economy that you must chain yourself to. And that's where the demand for the cash crops come from. Also, if you notice at the turn of the century, when we were in the great depression, the biggest pushers of cash crops were corporations buying out small farmers who were getting choked out of the market because they were no longer allowed to live as subsistence okay. or communal farmers. 
The, okay, but this is this is part of my problem here. So, for instance, like a cash crop in one of the most anarchic places on earth, uh, because it's basically impossible to rule, is Afghanistan with opium. Mm -hmm. And opium is not grown because some corporate push to get the entire world hooked on heroin. It's fucking no, no, no. You can you can say that the pharmaceutical industry abused opium. You cannot tell me that human beings don't just fucking love heroin. Oh no, no, absolutely. Okay? Humans human do. beings love wait, wait, heroin. Humans love drugs. Being propagandized. Wait, wait, to love yes, heroin. absolutely. I'm not saying that they're they're propagandized to love it. There's obviously a demand for drugs, but I think that um, Afghanistan is a very bad example. It is not. Um, I mean, you could argue Why? that in certain ways that there's like anarchic things that that are incidental as a result of it, but but. Afghanistan is a is was considered a, a a a key proxy state by two of the biggest imperial and nationalist powers, hyper nationalist powers in the world that completely demolished that country. I think they could have established a very fair, just, and probably lucrative opium trade that would have wouldn't have even ever touched on the level of uh, of opium addiction and 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 havoc wreaked by by our own medical industry the reason you can't really point to afghanistan <laughs> honestly as a representative of an anar anarchic location when it is literally it has been the, the place where uh where both russia and the united states basically threw bombs to scare one another and you know this to be true like a simple analysis of the of the russians engagement in afghanistan it was a, it but, was a okay but it was I, a slaughter okay, so of I'm, unbelievable I'm, proportions I'm, I'm mentally kicking back to the, the definition of anarchic without rulers. And, and basically, just to explain this to a, a little bit uh, for the audience or whatever. So Afghanistan is an incredible piece of geography. And, and what I mean by that is basically it's, it's mountainous, very difficult to access. There's like one highway that goes across the entire country. Um, and, and basically, there, there's a whole bunch of communities that live without any kind of contact with uh, the central government. Sure. Um, most people don't trust or like the central government. And the reason why uh, factions, both uh, the ones that we're allied with and the ones that um, are opposed to us, are so brutal is because they basically show up, kill the fuck out of people who resist them and then say, don't make us come back here. And that's how they maintain power and control. The, the thing about this, though, is that like if you were talking about operating on a day to day basis without interference from anybody else, they, they're. I, I can't think of another example in which like there there isn't a nation state um in in comparison and on top of that the the, the reason why I made I made this um I made this analogy or I made this point is because you you're you're talking consistently about the appetite of the manipulated masses in stated societies to consume mm -hmm. products that are bad for them mm -hmm. <clears throat> bad for the environment bad for this bad for that bad for this bad for that mm -hmm. Um, but I can't help but think that there are sociopathic, manipulative fucking assholes mm -hmm. that exist in this world that in a society in which there were, maybe I'm going to the utopian vision, there are no rulers, no laws, no enforcement, or it's all communally driven. There aren't people who are going to, th there's going to be people who take advantage of the goodwill of their neighbors mm -hmm. in order to basically be manipulative evil drug dealing murderous cunts under the the proposed philosophy and i view the state as a check on that power whereas you view it as what like a rival competitor like I, no i sure. view the state as the same thing as those types of powers and an anar this is i'm glad you mm. touched on this because this is something that i wanted to talk about which is that um anarchists and anarchist thinkers and the anarchist philosophy as a whole um, focuses on sort of perpetual resistance. The idea that, yes, there will always be people who try to seize power. And our goal is to create structures that do not let them do that, that make it very hard for them to do so through one way, right way or another. An anarchist would look at Afghanistan and go, hey, wait a second, that warlord that's moving in on your peaceful village, that is somebody that an anarchist should fight against. An anarchist should support those people's ability to be free from that warlord. That warlord is functionally... Um, it may not be a, a state, it might be a, a basically a monarch or something like that, but nonetheless, anarchists were, of course, a huge part of pushing against mon monarchy as well. All these forms of, of oppression, they're, they're not limited just to capitalism, but it depends on where we're talking about. I, as an anarchist... But, but what, what happens when what... Because th this is actually like a real problem that happens in the real world. What happens when a, a, a democratically elected or elder of a, uh, of a community who is basically... Uh, popularly supported by his community says, nah, bitch, that's my water well. Fuck off. And then the other person says, 
no, my family has come here for 500 years and fucking this, that, the other. And then you just start killing the shit out of each other in fucking blood feuds. How does anarchism solve this issue? Because I'll tell you how a fucking state solves it. A state solves it where you killed that motherfucker, you're going to jail for the rest of your life. You killed that motherfucker, we're going to try to arrest you. And if you try to resist us, we're going to fucking kill you. That's well, how actually, a fucking state actually, works. Actually, basically what it builds the power is, vacuum. Well, what will happen is that a state will move in and say, actually, this is neither one of your wells. This is our well now, and we're going to distribute it as you see fit. And then those people will probably... Uh, who knows? Maybe that well needed to be used for a international pipeline, and then those fa those. Um... No, come, okay. No, no, wait, Demon hold Mama, on a second. Demon wait, wait. Mama. You I want me to interject? You want me to interject? Please, can I interject? Like, okay. Like the the re the reason why, and and I am trying to be polite here, but the the reason why I am skeptical and hostile to this line of thinking is because I'm sure you can come up with ten thousand fucking reasons, maybe a million billion reasons mm -hmm. of how states have abused their power within the last century, let alone within the past like three thousand years, if you want to talk about proto states. I'm sure you can. And I'm sure I can come up with three thousand to ten billion reasons of how individuals abuse their individual power and all this kind of bullshit. The thing is though, I exist currently in a state that administers things to a certain degree. Are they perfect? No. Is Flint's waters fucked up? Sure. Uh, are farm subsidies perfect? No. Are like, do we have like perfect fucking food distribution? No. But at the same time, like, we're we're rich. We have food security. We have water security. Yes, we fucking do. No, Especially compared to a fucking anarchic society, I guarantee you, we fucking do. We have security compared to plenty of other fucking societies. Hell yes, we do. And on top of that, I think that my perspective is borne out by stats compared to all of the fucking places in which there is no fucking government or the central government is weak. Almost okay. guaranteed. So a couple of things I could say here. First of all, I strongly mm -hmm. reject the idea that we are rich. Once again, at, like, I, like I would expect from a nationalist, you're appealing to a construct. Who is the we? I'm not rich. The, the, the people I know in my life aren't rich. Fucking Jeff Bezos can launch himself into space, but we are not rich. You see, you've appealed to Compared a- to Hold who? on a second, let me finish. We are not rich. Me, my personal life, my my quality of life is reasonably good, but that's not because of that's not because we are rich. That's because I engage it specifically. It's unique in my position in that I'm an entertainer who I was lucky enough to find my way to get a camera. We could talk about all of that. That's not really necessary. But I was lucky enough to get a camera. I turned on my show and said, "Hey, if you like what it is, throw some money my way." And that's how this that's how my show arised. And so I have a, a decent quality of life because of that. But I go outside, uh, trust me, I live in a place where homelessness is a, is a current state of an emergency. We've had it declared for a very long time that we've had a homelessness emergency. There are a lot of people out here who are not rich, and yet you will sit here and tell me we are rich. No, your construct is rich, and that construct largely benefits people like, I don't know, Donald Trump, people like Jeff Bezos. That's not us. That's those people. And that's the thing that okay, I'm talking all right. about. Okay, I, I have to point out why this is well, a one, uh, uh, one second uh, for, before Connor responds. Uh, Dean Mama just letting you know, you just you passed 10 minutes. You're now at 8 minutes and 58 seconds remaining. Uh, Connor, you are at 13 minutes and 19 seconds. So go ahead, Connor. Okay, so I, I have to point out that why this is completely a historical. So so basically, you are rich. And on top of that, you're taught, like, just if you make $30,000 a year or more, you are part of the top 1% of the fucking globe, okay? Mm -hmm. you you just, just the food that you have just popped into your mouth, the guitar behind you, the air conditioning, if you have it, running inside your... You, your unit, the fucking, the art that's behind you, the fuck, yeah, yes! All of these are material fucking benefits that are not afforded to most people throughout history. And on top of that, this is one of the weird things about it. So um, you kind of appeal to the no nobility of yeomanry farming. Do you know what yeomanry fucking farming is? Yeomanry farming is working fucking 60 hours a goddamn week to bust your fucking ass to grow just enough food to not starve to death that's in the winter. That's not true, though. Winter. That's, 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 that's a Yes, it is. No, and it on top of that, this, hold on. This is why we have industrialized farming. This is why we have specialization. No. The whole reason, the, all of the wealth that has been developed in capitalistic nations is because, very specifically because of specialization. I trust you to, fill, uh, to fulfill a, a certain social role. I, you trust me to fulfill a certain social mm -hmm. role. And as a result, I can produce more than I could individually if I became like a fucking uh, a craftsman and a fucking hunter and a gatherer and a farmer. And like, uh, if I try to specialize into 10 different goddamn roles, I'm going to do all of them super mediocrely. So fucking specialization and then enforcing okay, the but... ability to engage in products and services is exactly why we're able to engage in the, even this conversation. Okay. So now, hold on no, a second. And I you, reject wait, this. Wait, wait, you've gone off on a ton of things. So first of all, um, mm -hmm. 
uh, richness, the way that you're using it, is a meaningless word. If you think that, like, because I have some of the, the modern luxuries afforded to me and a couple of others, the art behind me wasn't paid for, by the way. That was gifts, just so you know. Gift economy. But the thing that I keep finding is you keep making arguments, not for a nationalist society, but you essentially are making arguments for a more anarchistic worldview. Um, none of the, There's nothing about, I've never said anything about not needing specialization. Specialization happens. We specialize normally. My team that I work on my stream with is a team of, of organically specialized people. I needed an editor. An editor said, I will edit for you. I said, okay, I will pay you for editing. That's fantastic. And now there are, of course, more complex examples, which we could go into, but we don't really have the time there to go up. I assure you, there has been extensive writing about how um, complex uh, complex organizations can be constructed using anarchic means. The problem that you keep pointing to is this is this idea that um, that like, oh yeah, we need to like, we need to embrace all of these, these so-called uh, presumptions that the state tells us we have to um, for their own benefit. And once again, my relative um, wealth, like for example, saying that I, I make bec over 30,000 a year makes me, uh, th makes me a one percenter or something. Well, that's true on a statistical level. People who make significantly less don't have to pay the rent that I pay to live in this state. My, most of my money goes to rent and healthcare. So wealth is very much relative. And yes, there are some wonderful luxuries that I get from living in the United States, but there are wonderful luxuries that people enjoy elsewhere. Also, the idea that like the only thing that I'm talking about is yeoman farmers. No, I'm not. I'm saying that there is there should be a place for people who want to produce food for their community, that those things shouldn't be swallowed up and, and consumed by hyper corporate farms, which is what's happened, which is what's happened over the last 100 years, all of which are now the number one crop in America is corn. Corn, which nobody well, even we don't eat enough. Yeah, but I, but it's wait, the that's, it's not fuck the corn. That's hugely important. The fact that all of our farms in America have been converted to corn because that's convenient for the production of of plastics, for the production of high fructose corn syrup, which in America is in literally everything we eat. It's a self reinforcing problem, and the state assumes itself as a necessary you don't, solution. You don't think that? Okay, but uh, god damn it. So so the fucking point is so you're you're saying that the state is subsidizing this shit. I, like what people don't like sugar in an anarchic state people don't like fuel or plastics like no Wait, what? Would, nobody said that there, there Wait, i never be, made that there argument would be just as much appetite for these products regardless of whether or not it was subsidized and on top of that the fact that it's fucking subsidized makes it cheap enough for most people to consume readily like 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 the Wait, subsidization but that's bad. Argument. like Wait, that's you bad. can make it you can that's make bad. an appeal to inefficiency but i don't think you can make an appeal to whether or not like it's not a matter of efficiency i'm not making society. an argument of efficiency what okay. I, because hold on, i think but, wait, okay, hold on, but hold on, i want to i want to make a point because i think i think it's central to my argument okay so there, there's this concept, it's flawed, but I think it applies. It's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. It basically says that there's five, I don't know why you're rolling your eyes, and I'll be happy to hear your counterpoint to it, okay? So the, I said the thing. Um, so basically, when it comes down to, uh, you know, human need, there, there's very big, just to explain to the audience, I'm sure you're already familiar, there's physical security needs, so food, shelter, water. Those are the things that you need to prioritize. After that, there's security, physical security, financial security, in order to be able to take care of yourself. If you're not able to take care of these two tiers, you're not going to be worried about anything else. After that is social needs, the ability to have a family or friends and express yourself socially within a community. That's the next tier of needs. The next needs is ego. So basically egotistical needs, uh, achieving yourself with or achieving within a employment zone or artistically or whatever, ba basically filling your own ego. After that is self-actualization, which is basically becoming the best human being that you possibly can be. While still a flawed idea, the reason why I want, and the reason why I bring up this idea is because you were kind of like shocked that the libertarians um, would be uh, willing to subsidize the military war machine mm -hmm. um, because it basically abuses people worldwide and all that kind of stuff. The reason why I, I want to philosophically explain this is because the way that they, a lot of libertarians are like minarchists, uh, which I, I could fuck up the term and the concept, but I'm going to use it anyways, which is basically saying that the one thing that the state should do is provide that second tier of need, security, because without security, you're not going to be able to fulfill the, these other ones. And on top of that, these uh, these needs are supposed to be tiered, where if you're, you're not going to worry about trying to achieve art or work ambitions, if your social life is dog shit, if you can't feed yourself, if you don't have physical security and all of that kind of stuff. And so for me, what I view a state's role as is maintaining the ability to move up and down that pyramid for its citizens, while not necessarily sticking a hand behind their back and pushing them up the fucking pyramid. Um, so I'll leave it there. Uh, Demon Mama, before you respond very quickly, uh, 
just so letting you both know, uh, Connor, you passed 10 minutes. You're now at 9 minutes and 10 seconds. And Demon Mama, you are at 6 minutes and 38 seconds. So go ahead, Demon Mama. Um, yeah, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs has no real um, application here. I just think that most libertarians who call themselves libertarians aren't actually libertarians. They haven't really thought through their positions, and they don't really know why. They, they go along with the Republican Party, but they call themselves a libertarian because it feels nice to say that you're, you're a small state. Um, I really do believe that. Um, but um, I don't know. Like With regard to the appetite for high fructose corn syrup, um, until high fructose corn syrup was, was invented by corporations as a way to cram... Um, sugars into drinks. It wasn't even there was no demand for high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup is banned. But what was there oh, demand me. for? Hold on, excuse me, I'm not done. All over the world, high fructose corn syrup is banned because it's terrible. It's allowed here in the United States because uh, of a lot of reasons. Because corporations have quite literally lobbied the hell out of our um, out of our government to to push high fructose corn syrup into every single thing because it's cheap and it's cheap because it's subsidized by the government, the government which is lobbied by those very corporations. So that's it's a cycle that again plays to this nationalistic construct that yes you must do all of these things even if you even if you're like i don't really even like high fructose i don't even drink high fructose corn syrup drinks i literally avoid them because they're so bad for you and guess what we have plenty of drinks that have sugar in them but there's ways to get sugar that don't involve having to convert your entire agricultural sector to corn production which is what has happened in the united okay, states we, you you know that our entire agricultural production is not just corn it's a, it's just huge, a gross part huge of it. huge percentage like massive okay do you, do you know what okay do you know what corn is good for it's what it's one of the highest i, I this kind of goes back to an earlier point it's like it's one of the highest energy producing plants on the planet the reason why corn is worshipped or was worshipped in south and central america is because it gives you energy it has some level of protein and on top of that it has vitamins and minerals like corn but we're not, in and of itself is not nefarious no corn one is, is saying is that corn is nefarious based. in fact i'm saying okay, quite the right, opposite on, wait, 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 wait you want to you ask me a question let me respond part, to it let me respond to it it's so a listen part, let me respond sure. to it okay you ask me a question, let me respond to it. Corn is not, I'm not demonizing corn as a plant. Corn is fucking awesome. I love corn. But the reality is, is that we have endless tracts of corporate owned and corporate farmed, sometimes automatedly farmed land that just produce corn for the purpose of a handful of, of corporate products that are needed, such as high fructose corn syrup, to meet a need that has been manufactured. That has been manufactured by the people. Again, who are the ones who are lobbying the government to get those benefits? It is wait, not, wait, 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 okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Connor. Manufactured. Connor, Connor, okay. it is manufactured. Yep. And also, Connor, uh, Connor, that's absolutely manufactured. And also, you're you're standing for for the destruction of American agriculture. Mm -hmm. Can can I explain why it's not? And I don't give a fuck. I think sugar tastes better than fucking high fructose corn syrup. But I'm going to explain how it's not. Okay, so fucking high fructose corn syrup is near identical to fucking sugar chemically. That's, no, it is not. Oh no, my! You're fucking, so wrong. Do, no, it isn't. Do we want to fucking Google it and look at the chemical structure side by side on fucking Wikipedia right now? Because we can do that shit if you fucking want. Uh, fuck it. All right. Anyways, moving on. So the fucking point of it, the whole reason why this shit is fucking subsidized is because you're right. It does have a variety of uses. Ethanol, because we thought that we were going to be dealing with peak oil. Uh, that didn't happen because we ended up going to fracking instead of peak oil. Uh, and then also it can be used as a very cheap substitute for sugar because sugar is very labor intensive in order to harvest. Sugar, uh, sugar cane is a fucking pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. It basically shoots up to fucking 20 feet tall. And you have to beat it to fucking death in order to get anything out of it. It tastes fucking great, but at the same time, it's incredibly labor intensive. So high fructose corn syrup is a labor saving tool that's near chemically identical. Yes, it is. No, you're and then simply on wrong on that, this. You're just yes, dead wrong. And on then this. on top of that, if you just interesting historical fact, I'm just going to throw it out there for the fucking audience. Part of the reason why the Caribbean was so fucking brutal compared to North America is because they were growing sugarcane and sugarcane is so fucking labor intensive in order to beat down into a useful product. So while you can say high fructose wait, corn wait, syrup okay, is fucking hold on. poison, you did something... chances are sugar is just fucking poison in general. I mean, yeah, I don't disagree with when you. When consumed in vast quantities. Wait, hold on. So there's two things that you're wrong about. One, high fructose corn syrup is demonstrably worse for you. There's a reason why it's been banned in nearly every country in the world, except for America. It's terrible for you. The chemical okay. structure of high fructose corn syrup means that you're, you, you get a uh, a a a complex sugar that basically explodes into even more sugar when you digest it. Anyway, I don't need to get into chemistry here. You're just wrong about the idea that high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup is not about uh, customer happiness. It's about cost saving. And keep in mind that when you say that it's the labor intensity of of sugar that made the Caribbean bloody, no, it fucking wasn't. It was American corporations literally buying up paramilitary. I'm not fucking kidding you. This is a historical fact. They hired paramilitaries so they could. It, 
they could ensure cheap sugar so that they could sell it to consumers in America. Like you've got the. What you've got century the, are we talking about? The 1900s. Right, uh, one, like well, this is ridiculous. Uh, one second, uh, both of you, just before we, uh, uh, I, I, I wanted to uh, stop you earlier, but uh, there was like a, there wasn't like really any stopping moment. Just letting you know, Demon Mama, uh, you passed five minutes. You are now at three minutes and forty eight seconds remaining. Uh, Connor, uh, you are at seven uh, minutes and one second remaining. Um, yeah. Instead of uh, like wait, um, Demon Mama, you you only have like one uh, placeholder left, like the one minute time. So I won't uh, stop the conversation at one minute because if you're, I assume if you're talking, you don't want me to like ruin your train of thought. So I'll just like scream out like one minute left, Demon Mama. Uh, if you hit that point, all right, I won't uh, pause this thing again. So uh, feel free to start arguing about 19th century stuff again. Uh, whoever wants to start with that. Yeah, uh, I mean, all I'm gonna say here is that I mean, and I'll let let Connor respond. Is that you you keep assigning things to the to the wrong source. And it's very clear that that's that the, that the source that you're saying is, is not accurate by saying that that it's like the labor intensity of sugar that caused all the problems in the Caribbean. No, it wasn't. It was American corporations. It was a it was American government I, um, I- intervention. Absolutely. It intervention. When, OK, when Spa- when Spain still had colonies in the Caribbean, it was North America's problem that they were beating their fucking slaves to death? That's a weird-ass argument. No, not just North America. If we want to go back to the colonies, God, you don't want to talk about colonization. Colonization is one of the worst okay. Is one of the worst arguments. It, it looks All so right, bad listen, for nationalists. We, okay, we, we don't have time to narrow down our fucking, t- like, our fucking time frames or whatever, but I, I assure you that the Spanish Caribbean was very much a creation of its own fucking thing so anyways so yeah so here just googling terms because you're insisting that i'm inaccurate on something okay so the chemical composition of fucking sugar is 50 percent glucose and 50 percent fructose do you know what the fucking chemical composition of fucking uh fucking god damn it high fructose corn syrup is 55 percent fructose and 42 percent glucose it's literally off wait, by wait like a second, wait a second. hold on hold Can on you wait taste the no, fucking wait. difference hold like, on a second the, uh, that's wait. fucking that insane. is a that is a that you would no, insist no, that please, this is like please. chemically Save chemically me so different save the performance i'm sorry but i don't believe that you <laughs> actually yes you, this is this is massive you're, you're you're saying this is insane you don't know what five percent difference is would you drink a coffee that had five percent cyanide in it that you're the numbers that you're citing are meaningless if they don't have context that five percent change in fructose makes all the difference in the way your body handles it and we know this fructose the, and the glucose science are both kinds disagrees of sugar. with you you are just wrong on this every single major every <sighs> no. single nutritional organization no, no. in the world knows that high fructose corn syrup is terrible for you and the reason is because the ratio of fructose is bad fructose isn't good for us and yeah sugar Sugar isn't good for us either, but high fructose corn syrup is only used here because it's cheap and because everywhere else said, holy shit, this stuff kills our people. Okay. I'll I'll Google that, but I think this is bullshit. I mean, I highly Um, recommend you look into this because this is like, again, this is a matter of consensus in, in, in nutrition. Yeah, I'll be sure to check out the consensus between sugar and fucking high fructose corn syrup. And I know I, I sound like a smug douche while I'm fucking saying that. True. But I'm actually going to research it after this. I, anyway. I highly recommend it. Uh, it, is, it is worth reading. Okay. I will. Um, so, so um, mo- moving back, um, moving back to anarchism in general. If you're, if your primary argument, is, so, so I'll, you know, I'm a centrist, right? So I'll give you the fucking concession. Okay. If your if your primary contention is that people need to be more communally minded, mm-hmm. they need to be more individually minded, they need to stop looking to the state to save them, they need to create parallel structures to the state so we're not completely reliant on these fucking douchebags who end up shooting our dogs and raiding our houses for fucking marijuana. Um, if you're saying that the state self justifies through violence, if you're saying that they're uh, competing constructs that basically result in violence, I think I agree with all of that, and I think anybody who's libertarian minded probably agrees with you even if there's massive philosophical differences where where i disagree which you know i'm not trying to be you know mean or anything here but but just telling you where i disagree um basically i think that the state apparatus is necessary i'm memeing a little bit but i think twitter.com is evidence that fucking like a flat horizontal no hierarchy democracy is basically a bunch of fucking people cannibalizing the ever-living shit out of each other um and and yeah like i don't the uh, anarchic utopianism I would still have concerns, even if we said that this was a thousand year project to eliminate the state by basically getting people to be more communally minded. Uh, we've had this discussion in the past. I would still be concerned about like what happens if there's a rival space faring fucking nation, what your uh, uh, fucking planet. What happens when we bump into aliens like like that kind of shit? 
Because if we're all fucking living in our hippie communes and fucking holding hands, singing Kumbaya and fucking growing sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup, um, then we could be fucked and be eliminated as a species because we weren't ready for the competition from a rival interplanetary civilization. All right, uh, David, Mom, before you jump in really quick, uh, Connor, you just passed four, uh, five minutes left, so you also will only get like your one minute shout out. Uh, when you have that time remaining, uh, you're at four minutes and 10 seconds. Team Mom, you're at two minutes and 16 seconds. And then as a failure, as a moderator, um, there was about a 10 second period there where uh, Connor was talking and I didn't switch it from Team Mama. So uh, for the next, like, uh, when Team Mama was talking, I'm going to leave it on Connor for about 10 seconds just for the purposes of uh, transparency. So uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I don't really think any of that address any of my points. Uh, aliens is a whole other discussion that we could talk about. I could talk about how a, a, a potential utopian anarchic planet could could resist aliens or whatever um the fact of the matter is that's not what we're talking about here the state the state justifies itself and it uses those justifications to enact incredible violence and to completely disrupt um uh the actual cooperation of individuals in the name of of itself in the name of perpetuating itself i push and i argue that we should push for structures that do not allow power to fall in the hands of individuals that we allow that we build structures that are voluntary that um if there is a leader it is a leader whose purpose is to lead and not to be a hierarchical god above other people who can li decide who lives and dies our society is built on on hierarchies that are ridiculous and that don't make any sense and we don't need them humans get along really well by and large yes there are little conflicts there are all kinds of things but we work these out all the time we work them out by avoiding people we don't like we work them out by um by by uh having mediation there's all kinds of ways for us to work out conflicts but when the state gets involved you'll see things like the drug war happen you'll see things like uh the complete and utter hollowing out of american agriculture um anarchism is a f is a philosophy that suits the future much better a world where we have the internet and access to information and access to communication now you talk about twitter i don't even think i need to take this seriously because it is a meme but twitter is a website that is literally constructed to drive one conflict. minute left demon mama good Thank you. It's literally designed to drive conflict, and I don't think that it's a good representative of human nature at all. I've gone into great detail on this on my other streams, but I really don't want to do a breakdown of Twitter here. Please don't use Twitter as your basis for human engagement. A much better thing would be how your town gets along with its various members and how they support each other. And I know that when I, when I was involved in more communally focused thing, there was a lot more love and care for most of the people. There are obviously flaws and there are obviously things we need to change, but at the end of the day, it is the structures we must challenge in order to prevent constant domination by forces that by by institutions that we build up to give so much power to individuals thank you okay so this is this is my frustration because um going back to your original philosophical quote is the uh, the you know kind of like the el elimination of unjust hierarchies um but still nature uh playing um you know a role on what basic basically what social institutions are necessary in order for uh, human beings to function mm -hmm. um when i look at history i do see a decent amount of cooperation i do see people uh coming together for agriculture i see people it's coming everything. together for uh, community everything. i see people coming uh, together for towns and religion and all that kind of stuff what i also see is i see tribalism i see tribalism between uh rival violent groups with different um different perceptions on what the world should be and i think that defend I think that liberal democracy and democracy in general is, uh, you know, mixed with republicanism, because I do believe in a republic, um, is basically the way that you set up a social structure that can perpetuate into the future that incorporates all kinds of human beings. And I think at this point in time, there are, you kind of brought up earlier in your point that there was these like rival social constructs that we're in battle with. Um, I think we're absolutely in battle with these rival social con uh, uh, constructions. I think that um, authoritarian state capitalism or authoritarian communism, whatever you want to call it in China, is nefarious and evil and gross. Um, I think that if you go back, uh, you know, like a century and look at like Nazi Germany and all that kind of stuff, um, then basically ethno ba ethnic based fascism and uh, imperialism is gross because you can basically slaughter men, women and children for immutable characteristics. I think that's fucking gross. Um, and on top of that, when we talk about um, adopting this mindset, while I think it can be parallel to the state, I still ultimately think that there's a state that needs to enforce some level of governance, some level of administration, some level of security. And on top of that, I really, really, really don't mind having a social construct that is uh, idealistically in opposition to these other structures. Now we can talk about like uh, conflicting values. We can talk about compromises. We can talk about all that kind of shit. But I'm pretty sure if you look at like mixed economy, capitalism, liberal democratic societies, they are trying to perpetuate. They are trying to promote their uh, their values across the world. 
Um, so yeah, and I think those things are inherently positive. And if I have to use a state apparatus in order to promote that social construct around the world, maybe in the hopes that, you know, fucking 10,000 years from now, um, we can live in sugar-based uh, anarchic co or anarchic fucking um, communes, then fine. Uh, but Mama, states now. States now uh, and states for a while. Uh, just so you uh, are aware, uh, you, you have 20 seconds left to respond. So if there's anything you want to say uh, before you get uh, muted or anything like that, or unless Connor has another minute and a half that he wants to t say, uh, just letting you know how much time you have left. Because you don't have zero time, but you have yeah. 20 seconds. So, I can just say uh, something really quick and small, which is tribalism, I do believe, is to a certain degree somewhat natural. But that, but what you're describing, nationalism, is like hyper-alienated tribalism. It's the worst form of any form of tribalism. It makes everything worse. People having small tribal conflicts is not worried. Where right now what we have is a world that is in deadlock between imperialistic states that all armed with nukes and could eliminate everyone, even including their own citizens and the citizens of every other nation on earth anarchism is the real only All way for right. us to reach uh, justice demon mama as uh agree, agreed to uh you've been server muted for the next uh, minute and uh 27 seconds uh connor you get the last word on this um if you have anything left to say if you don't have anything to say uh we will just round down uh and you'll get an extra minute i still have 31 minutes for the next discussion uh so feel free uh i the timer isn't going to work for this so i'll use my phone timer for it so if you want to use any of your uh, one minute and uh, 27 seconds for a final statement on this topic before you go to the next one, you're welcome to do that. Yeah, I'm going to get on my status soapbox. So uh, basically, oftentimes when uh, I'm going to address something that Demon Mama didn't argue, um, but just because I feel like oftentimes when we use these words, this is what's thought about. Um, anarchism is often thought about without rulers as a definition. And so basically we talk about breaking down these social hierarchies, governments, all that kind of stuff down to the communal level. And then you live on a communal level. The reason why I don't believe in anarchism, the reason why I don't keep it as part of my foundational philosophy is because basically I think that the state reconstitutes itself very quickly. When you're on a communal level and you elect a council of elders in order to make communal decisions about what's going on, they're going to piss some people off and they're going to have to exert some level of authority. Once uh, somebody shows up to the town hall meeting in order to kill one of the political members who has been elected or is communally decided upon, you're going to have to have a security apparatus. Once you create the security apparatus and, uh, you know, basically there's fights, they're going to get involved in social disputes. At that point, you basically recommit, uh, you've reconstituted the police and you've reconstituted law enforcement as a concept. Uh, when it comes to certain things, I don't think that a anarchic group of people is any better at distributing resources than the states. As a matter of fact, I think individuals often make incredibly self-interested and shitty decisions all the time, and they're completely okay with passing off the externalities into their members. So unless you want to live in a society in which, uh, you know, we're basically back to mobs, like, you know, attacking and killing people didn't listen to what I in the water well, okay. then I'm not really interested in going back to the style of uh, living or thinking or anything like that. Um, to steam out, uh, steel man demon mama's position before we leave out, it and that is the end, actually, in terms of time. That was 1 minute and 27 seconds. Uh, Connor uses up all of his time. I'm going to unmute both of you right now uh, for the purpose of, like, the next uh, topic. Uh, Connor used up all of his time as well, so that means both of you will still just have 30 minutes uh, for the next topic of discussion. Uh, if you... Uh, are you both comfortable with starting again? Do you either need like a brief time, like say, like refill water, use the bathroom? Yeah, I would love to... Water? Yeah, I would love to take a quick break if we could just take a very quick one. Of course. Uh, let's all meet back in like uh, three or four minutes. Excellent. So. Thank you. Be right back. All right. Love you all. I'm going to go grab my drink. And I'm going right. to go to the bathroom and I'll be right back. All right, gang. Hello, chat. Hello, Game and Mama's chat. Uh, we're pogging right now. This is so much fun. Uh, I wasn't sure how this like kind of format would go, uh, but I am honestly very, very happy with how things are going. I think this is fun. I think it's informative. I think uh, the time constraints are encouraging them to, you know, have uh, a better understanding or uh, like just a respect for their own time and for other people's time. And I think they're responding to each other's points cogently uh, because neither, because both of them know that they can't uh, do like a, a gish gallop or a ramble. So I think it's encouraging a very, very good conversation uh, for the first topic. Hopefully we can maintain this energy uh, going in uh, to the second topic. So thanks so much, D uh, B, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Um, everyone, I will be right back. Um, I'm going to go fill up my water. Um, I haven't really needed uh, to talk very much, uh, but uh, I'll be back uh, for all that sort of stuff in a brief second. If you like uh, what we're doing here, if you like all this work, uh, please make sure to like follow the channel and you know subscribe to Demon Mama, follow Demon Mama, and then subscribe to Connor over on YouTube and all sorts of stuff like that. If you like what we do, uh, please support the channel. We are doing great stuff, and we are doing the big pogs. So everyone, I'll be right back. I just need to get my water and some protein bars because I am a hungry boy. So I will be right, right back. Never be good while I'm gone. Uh, while I'm gone, uh, 
one of my mods in chat, uh, Roxy, and uh, Roxy's in charge. Hello, hello. I am back. Uh, good to see everybody. Hope we're all doing big pog. Uh, we are... Oh, oh no, Roxy. I thought, I didn't know you were a mod. Oh shit. Sorry, Coco. I didn't know. Oh, good, 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 good. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that one. Oh, all Hello. Right. There we go. I'm back, everybody. All right, Roxy, you are modded. Nice. Cool, cool, cool. All right. No. <laughs> My uh, my chat I'm back. evolved into that. Oh, hello, hello, welcome, welcome. Hi. All right. Uh, hope you uh both enjoyed uh the first uh the first like uh half. Uh, so let's just uh jump right in uh to part number uh two. So let me describe uh the topic and briefly restate the rules uh just for the people who are coming in and haven't uh seen it. Uh, our second topic is going to be da 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 da. It is a radical environmentalism. Uh, as defended by Demon Mama versus environmental reform as defended uh, by Connor. I assume it's going to be an excellent conversation on uh, environmental policy. Isn't anything that we can do to help fix our planet and save it from the uh, uh, coming climate crisis? So everyone just remember, uh, both of them get equal uh, time. They each get a two-minute opening statement that doesn't affect that time. Um, if one person interrupts the other, uh, I make the interruptee uh, have the one that's losing the time uh, for that topic. And then again, if one of them uh, hits zero, I will mute them and allow the other one to speak freely for how much time is remaining, and I will give them uh, non-interruptive uh, reminders of their time once they pass 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, and at one minute I'll just shout out and say, hey, you have one minute remaining. So with all of that in mind, uh, uh, Demon Mama went first in the last uh, conversation, uh, so, we are going to, so we are going to give it uh, to Connor for the opener of this one, and then um, two minutes is the, like, the benchmark for this, but if you go under or over... Uh, we'll just uh, give the exact same amount of time to Demon Mama. So no, like, uh, massive thing. Just don't do, like, a five-minute uh, soapbox speech. So uh, no. go ahead, Connor. No, it's okay. I think I can... Uh, this was actually really uh, quickly mirrored onto a previous debate uh, that we had. And I actually have a decent amount of hopium. I, I know that it's um, scary. I know climate change is scary and what's coming in the next century is scary. Um, but I do have hopium because I think that these things can be sold to conservatives. Um, I think that it's a, a question of packaging. I think it's a question of marketing. And I also think that um, <clears throat> this kind of goes back to the previous argument. I think that you can achieve these without a high level of force. Um, while high density urban planning might be good for cities going forward, um, I think we need to integrate that into the system that we have now. When it comes to technologies, nuclear, renewable, um, natural gas, quick start plants, and all that kind of stuff, we can get into the technical details in the open. Um, but basically, I think there's a lot of things that we can do and make it muscular and sexy for conservatives. Because if there's anything that you can't do to a conservative is tell him that he has to, like, respect the environment or become a nicer person. Like, that is not a way to fucking sell, uh, basically, a Green New Deal or climate change policy to a conservative. Um, I kind of joked about this a little bit, but basically the nude Ford F-150 Lightning, it's a truck that goes like zero to 60 in five seconds. Um, it's pure electric. It has five, like 400 or 500 uh, horsepower. Um, it has like three hours of charge. It's pure EV. The way that you do that is basically having a co-sponsorship with Monster Energy Drink and sell it to fucking boomers in order to be fucking, you know, like, hey, you can put your gun rack on your fucking, on your uh, electric truck that does zero to 60 in four seconds. Um, so I think that's a lot more pragmatic than like, uh, I don't know, completely overhauling 
when Demon Mama previously talked in, in the debate about, uh, in the previous debate, about, like, redoing streets and cities, like, I do not see American cities being ripped up and jackhammered in the next, like, 50 years and rebuilt in a new image. I just don't see it. Um, so, yeah, I'll leave it there, and I'm excited to get into the open. Thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, I can um, I'm just making sure I don't have any reverb. Uh, okay, we're good. All right, so uh, Demon Mama, uh, you have two minutes and three seconds uh, on the clock. Connor had almost on the dot, so two minutes, three seconds for your opening statement. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I simply want the audience to consider, what do you do when climate change is barreling down about you and your government has been ignoring it for 50 years? Because that's the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, whether through congressional deadlock, whether through lobbying, whether through misinformation or massive uh, propaganda campaigns that claim that climate change isn't happening, we find ourselves in a position where our government is incapable of saving us from climate change. Governments are not going to do it. They simply aren't. The timescales do not line up, and every major climate scientist in the world is saying this, that not only are we behind schedule, but we are now surpassing every single day landmarks that we shouldn't have. If you go and you even look at the footage that's come out of the flooding in... Um, uh, in, in China and the flooding in Germany, the uh, the fires in all across the United States right now, the drought that's currently happening in my state. Um, this is a rapid acceleration and every single environmental scientist in the world is screaming about it and nothing is being done. And I think that is because, uh, to tie this back a little bit to what we were talking about before, we have embraced a, a state solution by sort of passive um, by sort of passive and active reinforcement that doesn't actually address the problems. Again, we are rich. No, the 1% is rich. Everybody else is going to be affected by climate change. We have to change that and we have to do it radically. We can't aim for electoralism when there is a gridlock in the, uh, in the Congress. We have to organize as communities of people an anarchic, radical environmental change. And yes, while I agree that jackhammering up streets is probably not going to happen, what is going to happen if things don't change is abandonment. And that means we'll need to rebuild anew. And when we build anew, we need to build things that are, will last and that won't make the problem worse. Uh, we are barreling towards climate catastrophe and we need to fix that. We need to address it seriously and we need to address it as communities and individuals because the state is not coming to help us. They aren't. It isn't happening. All right. Thank you, Demon Mama. So uh, with all that in mind, we're going to go into the open. Uh, Connor, uh, I assume we're going to throw it to you first so you can start responding to that. Uh, so go ahead, buddy. Yeah. Um, the I, I'm always trying to figure out when people are, are very doomer about uh, climate. I always try to figure out if it's like a rhetorical strategy or if it's like actually like, hey, we're all about to fucking die. Um, and one video that I would like to cite because I literally just watched it today and it's fucking fantastic, um, is climate change is an absolute, uh, nightmare by up is not jump. Uh, so again, climate change is an absolute nightmare. This is why up is not jump. Um, and it really does address like a lot of like the, the, ooh, uh, climate change. I'm skeptical about it. It addresses a lot of that stuff. Um, because basically what's going on is we are in a traditional warming period, uh, based off of like the cycles, uh, from whatever. But the way that we, we have warmed is about like 10 times faster than normal. And I think like almost like a tenth of the time or something like that. You would have to check out the video specifically in order to do it. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, when you look at all the variables that are going on, uh, it, it's pretty much guaranteed to be CO2. It's almost like virtually guaranteed to be CO2. Um, when it's said to be CO2, though, there's three major sectors of industry that we can look at for reform and for change uh, without becoming Luddites. Uh, you know, if we wanted to smash everything, and uh, we, we could all be um amish tomorrow and solve climate change uh if you wanted to but i don't think anybody's really interested in that including me um so the three technological areas that we need to reform are uh transport agriculture and energy um energy is probably the most foundational um so uh and i'm just talking about like power inside the house uh so when it comes to that everything needs to be electric inside the house and we need nuclear renewable and maybe uh carbon capture and then uh, the reason why I brought up like quick, uh, quick turn natural gas turbines is because during like peak energy, basically you need something to uh, take on that peak energy and quick turn natural gas turbines are, are what's being built right now. And they're about 70% less efficient than uh, or 70% more efficient than coal. 
I know I'm ranting a lot, but I want to set the stage so you have lots to t pick apart. Um, when it comes to uh, vehicles, uh, like you said, I, I don't think that we're going to be jackhammering city streets. And I think that uh, truck drivers and, you know, uh, the conservatives who want to hunt with their fucking guns or whatever, I think you can still sell them EVs. You have to make them sexy, though. You can't sell them Priuses. You can't talk to them about, you know, how they're going to be saving baby seals and shit. You have to make it muscular. You have to make it sexy. I think EVs are perfectly in line with Americanism. And on top of that, bring back Teddy Roosevelt. Okay, Teddy Roosevelt was a sexy motherfucker who hunted and preserved the national parks and shotguns and all that kind of shit, but he was also an environmentalist. So you can sell environmentalism to Republicans, you just have to make it sexy and muscular. Final point, when it comes to agriculture, uh, the primary culprit is beef. And what we can do right here is lab-grown meat. It's a new technology that's coming out in the past three to five years. They can literally take a growth tissue outside of a shoulder of an animal without killing the animal, they can stick it in a sanitized vat and grow it with sugar and sunlight. And then basically you can create as many steaks as you want and as much beef as you want with like 99% less uh, CO2 pollution and uh, from the agriculture and then 99% less methane, which is the main thing that's produced by animals. Um, so I think this is all within reach. I don't think it was technologically possible until now. Mm. Um, so I think that uh, I would be curious to see how it was technologically possible before and I'll stop ranting right now. Sure. Okay. So there's a couple of things I could say here. First of all, there are problems with electric vehicles. The The reality is that our cities are designed in a way that are inherently wasteful. Um, individual car ownership is, is a trash way to build a society. I'm sorry. It's just true. Um, I am lucky enough to have an electric car, um, but I recognize, um, which is very nice for me, but not all that much of a big solution in the big picture. Um, electric cars require a lot of po pollution still to create. And there are better ways of doing this that we simply do not engage in because of ideological and cultural um, decisions. Um, with regard to lab-grown meat, while I agree that lab-grown meat shows promise, we're nowhere near um, the, the ability to adopt it rapidly. And our meat is, consumption is both subsidized by the government, lobbied by massive meat companies like uh, Tyson, which does chicken but is nonetheless very problematic, um, and, and also... Um, hugely damaging to the environment. We have enormous problems that aren't going to be fixed by these small steps. And the thing is, I don't think, I don't really, I reject the characterization that I'm Doomer. I'm not Doomer. I believe that, that we're going to survive. I think that humanity is going to survive. I just think that the more time that we neglect, the worse the situation is going to be. Um, there is no negotiating with nature when we look at this, uh, when you can go onto the climatecentral.org map and you can see their projections for 2050 is to have huge swaths of new york city underwater that is not you can't negotiate with that people are going to move they're going to migrate and that's going to be a massive crisis and we need an answer for what happens when that happens and right now there isn't one the government is in is in gridlock on this issue so it comes down to communities communities need to start en engaging and organizations need to start engaging in building um, in, 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 in uh, uh, establishing best practices for sustainable food farming, for uh, advancing um, green energy production, because I too would love to be able to have internet and, and, uh, and electricity in the future. But at the rate we're going right now, there is only going to be a handful of people who actually have that. And it's not going to be the average American. It's going to be the turbo rich. So the world that, that you're talking about, the Luddite world, is going to be what many of us are damned to if we don't learn to adapt. Now, um, with regard to the, co the, the, the comments about conservatives, um, I don't entirely agree with you. I do agree that it needs to be sexy, but I don't think that, and that's why I don't really care about Teslas or, or stupid electric cars. I don't think that's the problem. I think that encouraging people to learn how to shoot, how to hunt for um, self-sustenance, giving people life and survival and self-sustenance uh, self skills is super awesome and also super interesting. I grew up in rural New England. I learned these things in school. They're very valuable to me, and as a result, I, ha I love nature. I love going out and having all these fun things and shooting guns and all of that. Like, that's me. I am that type of person. I'm not a conservative. But also, the conservatives that I knew back in my home state were not like this. Now, the Trump era of conservatism has taken on a new flavor, but it was interestingly, in Maine, there was a, a bipartisan agreement on cons conservation, except when it conflicted with business interests. The only time in uh, in my home state when you would see the environment get hollowed out was when there was an opportunity to bring in a large corporation. For example, a, a historic wetland was destroyed after massive lobbying by Walmart. But on every other ecological issue, it was bipartisan. All of the people in my home, very natural state, 
agreed with these things. It is actually easier to communicate and have communal change and uh, reinforced by individual action that is organized, not just I'm going to buy less meat myself and that's it and I'm going to call it good. I'm talking actual organization of communities to solve these problems. Otherwise, those communities may no longer exist in the near future. I, I would again say that I don't think this is a doomer position at all. I think this is a bloomer position. It's just realistic. We don't get anywhere by denying the reality in front of us. The reality is that our country is getting destroyed by climate change right now. Every single year, it's getting worse and worse. We have a smoke season here where I live now in Seattle because the fires are so bad in, in California and the last like five major fires have been lit. Have been, was, I don't know what the heck that was. Um, was there, is there, okay. It's my, it's my dog who has a cone scratch, still trying to scratch his face. So oh, okay. I'll mute myself. <laughs> I'm almost done anyway. So, um, but yeah, the, uh, I I think that um, that we we need to be able to act on this, or these communities will no longer exist. And I and I fear that uh, that to tie back to the nationalism, I fear that nationalist hyper authoritarian structures will will react with violence as they have right now to climate refugees. If you see how people are treated on our southern border, guess what? That could be you in a couple of years. It probably will be you in a couple of years statistically. We should be realistic about this, and we should aim to build communities that are sustainable, that are uh, vibrant, that are beautiful, and that have internet access. But we can't do that by sticking our head in the sand and denying what's happening. Sorry about that. Um, he might need to leave the room. So, anyways, the... Yeah, so... I, I want to get to some counterpoints. I said the word again. Um, but I want to ask you a couple of questions because uh, I, I'm still a little bit confused about solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so when I talk about nukes, natural gas, maybe even fusion would be mm -hmm. dope if we get it in the next few years, uh, and combined with renewables, I don't think this is a small project. I actually think this is probably like a multi-trillion dollar global investment um, in order to completely revolutionize the, the energy sector. Uh, when I talk about shifting meat uh, to, to lab-grown meat, I'm talking about a massive cultural shift because, frankly, I told my parents about lab-grown meat because they were talking about getting it on the market by 2022. And my mom basically said, I would never eat that. I'm like, what if it was genetically identical and you didn't have to kill an animal in order to do it? She's like, I don't care. I would still kill an animal. It's like, well, fuck. I guess that's the culture that I have to fight. Um, so the, the, I'm not – while I'm bloomer about my own prescriptions – um, and then I, I know like EVs, are, there's like limitations when it comes to batteries, like uh, lithium, you know, uh, lithium for batteries. They're, they're working on graphite batteries. We'll see. Um, I know that individual car ownership isn't great, but I think uh, switching everybody to EVs, where at least the only carbon that's being emitted is the ones that are used in production and not necessarily after that. And if they're hooked up into an electric grid after that, then that's way less of a fucking problem. And then on top of that, if we add on top of that carbon capture, I don't see any of these things as moderate. I see these things as quite extreme. Uh, maybe I'm looking at it from like a nationalistic lens, which is part of the reason why we don't agree on prescriptions. Um, but then that's kind of where I'm curious because I'm talking about like a multi-trillion dollar investment in energy. I'm talking about shifting culture completely when it comes to vehicle usage. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about shifting culture completely when it comes to meat consumption mm -hmm. and the products that we use for meat. I don't see these as simple things. And I don't see these as things that I, even, even if I solely dedicated the rest of my life to achieving these things, I think that I would achieve a tenth of what I wanted to achieve in the next 30 years. Um, so my question is, I heard the term organizing and building sustainable communities and i just don't know what that means mm. like what are the prescriptions like what what are what do you want people to do when they wake up and then if my ideas are kind of like fanciful and hard cells are your ideas easy cells or cells that you think that can be made yeah, um, I'll pull on a little quote from our, our dear friend and philosopher, uh, Slavoj Žižek, which is that we shouldn't be demanding a higher standard of living. We should, we should be demanding a better standard of living. I think that many Americans are very dissatisfied with their life as it currently exists. Many of them remember, uh, I mean, I even remember this. I remember how different my own childhood was from now. This is not to say that we're Luddites, but to say we should go back to Luddism or anything along those lines. Just that we have we have constructed ourselves in such a way, arbitrarily, mind you, largely at the bidding of major corporations that influence our government. 
um, that we, we, we live lives of endless work, of gig economy labor all the time. I think that we can build um, more localized economies that are focused on meeting the needs of people nearby that cuts out the need for a lot of our wasteful um, logistics. We have the space for it. We have the people for it. We just don't have the political will. And this is the problem. The problem, the, the, the appeal that I'm making and the reason why I'm pushing so hard for a for like anarchic solutions to this is because I, I tell you again, this is not a matter of doomerism. It's simply a fact. Our government is not acting fast enough. They have not acted fast enough and they are not going to act fast enough. Even if they do the things that you propose, which they seem to be unable to do, that would not even be close to enough. That is not radical enough to deal with the changes that we're looking at. And here's the thing. If we don't take a path that actually meets these things heads on and comes up with solutions that people can work on together to save themselves and their communities, they're just going to die. And I don't want that. I don't want people to just die because the state knows that, well, okay, yeah, we lost a couple places in Seattle, but it doesn't affect me. We lost a couple of acres in here, but the people who are ultimately running it aren't affected by it. And that is what we've seen. We've seen a, a, a resistance to any sort of meaningful um, environmental change, and, and we've only seen things get worse and worse and worse. Again, individual car ownership is a, is a problem. It's a problem because you t it takes a lot to create and ship and move cars and then those cars maybe don't use as much gas but the crazy thing is i have an electric car and getting an electric car charged is almost impossible in america because there's been no investment in an electric infrastructure and there isn't going to be one it hasn't come yet we should have had it already what we get instead is um like the local ikea which has an absolute grift electrical uh private a private electrical company that charges you a one-time fee of $20 to activate your account so that you can charge your electric vehicle for 25 cents for the electricity. It's ridiculous. We do not have the, the, the infrastructure to do this. I believe it is easier to sell Americans on the idea that, hey, guess what? We should start doing things that are really focused on our local culture, that we should do things that are lo focused on our community and not, and that these communities can work together on a large scale. The internet makes it possible for communities to communicate their needs and even to work out logistics. But the problem that we are right now is that we are thralls of massive corporate polluters that are destroying our planet and they don't care about whether we have to live as Luddites or not. You or I, if we live in a coastal state, we're going to live as Luddites. We're going to probably be displaced and live in refugee camps and they're not going to care. They're not going to do anything about it. They haven't done anything about it in the last 60 years. So this is not a doomer perspective. This is me saying those people aren't going to save you. We have to save ourselves. And the way we do that is by advocating for doing it ourselves, by getting together, by organizing. I have some ex uh, some great ideas about this, but one such example that I've proposed with regard to um, uh, meat com consumption is that I've proposed that um, that vegans get together and they make a, a, uh, a social community-minded... Um, meet people where they're at a uh, series of, of resources that help people easily and cheaply um, convert over to less meat heavy diets. This would have a massive effect if you even had partial adoption. It would do massive changes for this. But if we could get this, if we could get more power behind this, this could change the entire world. And likewise, if we start building our own structures, maybe uh, maybe we just need some people who have a, uh, maybe, I, maybe I become a big streamer and someday I form a, a bus company, a bus co-op that does a uh, bus transit around and we work these things out that are, again, this is the, the concept of the sort of uh, dual power structures. Um, these are the sort of things we need to do because the government's not doing it. And um, of course, there are some things that make me a little more doomer. The power of, of oil companies to crush their opposition, the power of some of these tech startups to completely crush their opposition um, is pretty massive. Their, their power is unbelievable. And maybe we can't overcome that, but I'm not a doomer. I think we can. And I think we can do it ourselves by organizing together, by, by pooling our knowledge, by accessing the unbelievable free information that's available on the internet, educating ourselves and building structures that do better for our society and don't just leave us to become Luddites when we are inevitably left behind by the, the, by the literal billionaires that don't give a shit about us. Okay. Well, so I, I, I pulled out probably two specific prescriptions that I kind of liked, um, but, but I want to nail you down a little bit harder sure. so um so basically I, I love the word thrall by the way i don't know if anybody plays uh the video game destiny but thralls are some of like the grossest enemies in there and they're just like these little like you know like zombie monsters that come after you i love shooting those bastards in the face so 
Um, I have one question that I want to post at the end, but you, you kind of pointed out that there's no investment in electric infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of what I was proposing was basically saying like, you know, we need this multi-trillion dollar investment and we also need to change the culture around uh, electric car ownership, uh, lab need and uh, basically all that kind of stuff. And also on top of that, one of the things that you said that I, that I think is actually incredibly important. Um, you mentioned abandonment mm -hmm. um, as an opportunity to rebuild. I think that's super fucking smart. Because if I go to my city council right now, and if I say like, hey, um, single car ownership is going to destroy us all. We need to jackhammer the fucking streets right now and uh, create a high density urban housing. I'm going to get laughed out of the fucking room. Uh, I might even get, get arrested, right? Mm -hmm. um, so whereas if there are new opportunities, for instance, remote work, um, is changing the American economy. So people are moving to new cities. Um, if those developments were basically saying like, hey, we need to start thinking about the way that we consume stuff, maybe high, uh, uh, higher density urban housing that is still um, pleasant for the individual to live in. Um, maybe that's the way that we should build the city as it grows up. Because if we do the quarter acre, 1500 square foot, three bed, two bath shit, we're just going to fuck the planet even harder. So I, I think the abandonment thing um, was a really good point, especially as people move inland and cities inland grow. Um, I think that that's an important point. Um, the only, the, my beef, um, my beef is coming from, um, I've heard two good suggestions that were specific. Mm -hmm. uh, meet people where they're at, which I think is fucking hilarious and should be the banner with meat spelled M-E-A-T mm -hmm. and then fucking bop, and then just have like literally go to your uh, local farmer's market and just have like 30 fucking vegans and vegetarians or whatever, like cooking dope ass fucking meals and being like, yo, I understand that we have a bad rap, but this is shit that you can prepare on your own. So literally like just creating that banner and getting half a dozen people to fucking cook and go to the farmer's market and promote that shit. That's fucking genius. But while it's genius, it's just a reduction and a slight modification in culture. Mm. That's I'm not saying it's not a good step. Yeah. I'm just saying that it's a slight reduction. It is not a cultural change. Well, then yes. uh, the bu the I'll, I'll wrap it up. But the um, but the bus cooperative again. I think that's a great fucking idea. Uh, it's pretty clear that um, bus services are underprioritized. Part of the reason why in our previous debates I was fucking I do, yes. snobbing at the fucking buses is because I don't want to fucking drive in a shitty old rundown bus covered in fucking jizz and stinking to fucking you know stinking to people who don't take care of themselves. That being said, creating a cooperative, you can basically have rules for the cooperative about like normal sociable behavior and you can improve the routes. But again, I want to point out that that's just like a reduction. So even if you're a hundred thousand air fucking streamer who buys a couple of buses and runs them in Seattle and you, you basically create this cooperative with good lines and like all that kind of stuff, it's still just a reduction. It's a start, but it's a reduction. Um, and then that's kind of where for me, um, while the national level solutions that I proposed may not seem popular right now, I think they are going to be popular when Germany fucking floods more aggressively than it already is. When Seattle gets not just the country, but the city starts to get taken out by fire. Um, when uh, New York basically has to create dikes and levees in order to stay above ground. When Miami has to create dikes and levees in order to stay above ground because they don't want to abandon a multi-million or multi-billion dollar city uh, to the ocean. Um, so I think these things will become more popular as these threats loom. Um, but I think the national level response is more likely to address these current concerns in a more comprehensive way. I mean, I oh, wish... One second. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, just one second. Uh, for both of you, um, this consider this a 20-minute warning uh, for each of you. Uh, both of you came like really close to it. Uh, Connor actually passed it. So, Connor, right now, you are at 19 minutes and 24 seconds. And Demon Mama, you are at 20 minutes and 18 seconds. Uh, so, just uh, I'm not going to do... Uh, I'm not going to stop it again once Demon Mama finishes talking, just to help like with the uh, flow of the conversation. I'll say something again once one of you goes below 10. So, uh, Demon Mama, uh, go ahead. Yeah, of course, I would love to welcome, um, you know, certain types of, of, of many types of, of state interventions that could help the environment but I just I don't it hasn't happened and and also one thing I wanted to point out is that talking about investment in green energy um it's really shocking because if you go read a lot of like uh, uh mid mid 20th century eco anarchists they were talking about solar and wind power in like the 50s 60s and 70s these these projects were had progress going on them and were abandoned in favor of fossil fuel companies because fossil fuels were the entrenched interest you know standard oil exxon mobil um these massive companies 
change the direction of our technology. It is a natural progression that we go to to um to so solar, that we go to wind. We know that these things can have have huge potential. That hydroelectric, there's so many options, but they've been abandoned. They've been defunded. They've been um. Uh, sometimes bought up and then immediately collapsed by the corporations that that have an interest in polluting the world and um not to mention it, we could even get into the shocking revelations of the last few decades as far as how far the propaganda has gone in the repression of climate science the fact of the matter is though that here in america right now we have massive homelessness problem um people don't like to talk about this but we have homelessness problem all over the united states no uh, the government government solutions that that invest in green energy aren't going to fix that those people are already becoming climate refugees. And we all know that we're only, what, two two paychecks away from being homeless? Most Americans are in that position. The vast majority of Americans find themselves in that position. Oh my God, that's scary. If things, if costs keep going up, more people find themselves in the street. These people are the climate refugees and they're already experienced the, ex experiencing this right now. I lived in an area that was racked uh, just a year ago. I fled north because I lived in an area that was completely burned um, uh, and our life, our actual like quality of life was severely damaged by the wildfires in California. We had our power shut off for weeks at a time. I'm saying we didn't get in, we, we lived like, like Luddites. We had to power, we didn't have heat. We didn't have AC at all. We didn't have internet. We didn't have power. We had battery operated everything for weeks at a time because of shutoffs by a state sanctioned corporate power provider. And um, this is really, really, a huge issue and I think that people underestimate how bad it really is for a lot of people even in America but it's only going to get worse which means we need answers we need answers like these like a cooperative bus company we need answers like uh, a, a group of passionate vegans getting together and teaching people we need them to inspire other people teach other people we need this to grow as fast as possible and I think that that um, pointing out um, and showing people the ravages of, of climate change and being realistic about it not doomer but realistic, saying this type of flooding could be coming to your area. What are you going to do if it happens? What are you going to do to connect with your community? How are you going to protect the people around you? How are you going to do this? Get people thinking about that so that they engage in community-minded stuff. I don't think that we can do this as individuals. I 100% don't believe that we can handle climate change as individuals. Individualism would be our death. However, I do believe that as communities we can, and communities teach other communities, especially in the age of the internet. We need tools that are guaranteed to be free. We need uh, lesson plans that are guaranteed to be free. Cook, uh, cookbooks that are guaranteed to be free. We need manuals for producing certain types of tools that are guaranteed to be free. This is why I support open source to such a great degree. But I think that we should go further and make agricultural tools. I think that we should make survival tools. I think that we should make water purifiers that are open source and free. And that the people who do have the resources to do this or people who might be able to uh, find themselves in a position to do this should push for that very well. And that's why I advocate for a radical view of environmentalism. So there, I think I addressed multiple of the things that you brought up, but I'm going to cede my time now. Yeah, so um, I like this. Um, the The reason why I like this is because I am I am completely reliant on basically shit getting bad enough that the state makes the right choices, right? Like, like that. That's what I'm completely reliant on. Yeah. Um, so I want to get into. Uh, I probably cuss too much to actually get into politics. Um, but if it if it was a possibility um, to get into politics and to advocate for these positions on a popular level, I absolutely would. Uh, the the millennials uh, who have been elected um, are largely assholes. So, can I pop um, in for I one second? I, I actually wanted to. Can I Sorry. pop in for one second? First of all, yeah, you don't swear too much to be a politician, and also <laughs> electoral politics isn't the only way to get involved in politics. I believe sure. that you could be, and I and sorry if I'm walk, stepping out of line here and breaching um, debate topics, but I genuinely believe that you could be a local leader towards these sorts of things. Um, Bo of the Fifth Column is somebody I shout out all the time because he teaches actual community survival skills that are very valuable, and he teaches them from a from Florida, where his community has been hit by multiple hurricanes and have ha actually had to use these to thrive and survive. Anyway, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually weird. I was going to bring up as a sub point that I actually live in Florida and we're just kind of used to surviving like this. <laughs> like, it's like it's kind of what we do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but just just thinking um, creatively about stuff to do, um, you know, 
weatherproof greenhouses, basically like rigid greenhouses that could help uh, uh, grow agriculture, doing local agriculture, converting backyards into grow spaces, um, weatherproofing, basically uh, either sandbags or, or elevating your property or, or basically thinking about ways to deal with flooding. Um, these are all things that I, I think would be important from a communalist uh, or communitarian standpoint. And also, I think it would be really cool. What, what I heard from you, though, uh, which I don't think um, anarchists or leftists are, are particularly good at because they don't like hierarchy. Um, but what, but uh, what I did hear that was, um, I think, probably necessary in the thing that I would pull out of it was the, the codification of environmental survival knowledge. Um, and what I mean by that is basically like uh, the anarchist cookbook is like a, is a best selling, you know, whatever book from, you know, 20 years ago mm -hmm. um, that has a whole bunch of, you know, like how to build napalm and like all that kind of bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, I think you could do a climate catastrophe uh, uh, survival book. And people um, have, and then, by the way, they have they, these things do exist. Yeah. OK. Yeah. But but then um, how do we um codify it popularize it and implement it on a communal level which i think is the harder thing um and then uh the the one thing that i thought was really important that you said um building a community mindset and the reason why is because i live in a atomized community um i barely know my neighbors and the ones i do know i don't like um so basically wh what i've kind of joked about is like if this shit goes sideways mm -hmm. i have a gun i'm gonna survive but I'm going to do nefarious shit in order to survive. Whereas if you actually built a community-based mindset, you could have community food, uh, community food security, mm -hmm. community security, um, communications, first aid knowledge, all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you built that out with other like-minded individuals, then you would probably stand a better chance of surviving the thing. And I think that's fucking beautiful and dope. Um, Hell yeah. so, can I, can yeah. I mention something um, so, like that? Um, just as a, a very mm -hmm. practical, real example, my local, uh, mm -hmm. my local anarchist political organization group during COVID ran a massive, absolutely massive, and this was run out of a Google sheet. That was the level of, of there was, the, the hierarchy mm -hmm. was not there. It was, uh, hierarchy was organizational only and never, and everything was voluntary. Ran a massive food delivery option, which I did. I went and actually went and delivered food, um, multiple times. And it was, they delivered hundreds of thousands of dollars of food with just donations volunteered time and a little bit of organization they literally saved people i can't tell you what it was like to go deliver food to somebody's house and have them just be like thank you for doing this like my family wasn't going to eat otherwise and that's that's like the personal part but when you look at it on a big scale they did it they answered when the state didn't when our state didn't have enough food right. to do that it was anarchist groups it was groups that were willing to say no we're going to do this we're going to put out a call find who can actually do this and bring people together and i think that's important i think we should engage in that sort of thing more we should encourage it more so when we're talking about adoption mm. and how we um get our culture to be like this well you have to you have to adopt an anarchist mindset you have to go forward and say no this is where it doesn't matter what the state says it doesn't matter if they're going to argue back and forth for to pass some you know means tested food bill that won't even help most people find a way to feed the people in your environment find a way to feed your community find a way to work together with each other and build those connections and guess what reality is you're going to have some people that you don't like that you don't get along with but guess what just work with other people there's tons of people around you okay you you literally the thing that i was going to bring up you said at the end and uh hans i'm sorry that this is so fucking wholesome pilled right now okay no, sorry. No, no, like, this is this is great like, <laughs> I, 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 I guess it, you, you don't have, you don't have to kill each other like, I'm, I'm really enjoying this i'm going to use this like well into the future for like more formats like this is fucking please amazing. i love I it love okay okay so the the very the very last sentence you said is probably the thing that i think is most important and it's one of the things that I wish I could literally like fucking download from my brain and transplant into younger people. Mm -hmm. um, I think the political binary has fucking destroyed us. Um, it, it is literally like it, it makes it incapable of talking. We have to win against each other. Um, even in this debate, I am I am very much pro my national level action, but I also know that this is probably like a 20 to 30 year plan in which like climate disaster has to occur to build the political momentum in order for people to do it. I'm going to be in my fifties or sixties. I'm probably going to be on my fucking way out existentially by the time that anybody is taking the actions that I'm suggesting. Whereas um, community action, you could start tomorrow. You could start fucking, you could start today. Um, and, and that's the thing. Uh, okay. Sorry. This was the important thing that I wanted to get to is right wingers. Um, tend to be 
less sympathetic, empathetic, mm -hmm. um, and don't understand things until they see them. They have to see it in person. Um, but also right wingers tend to have a lot of really important skills. Um, so whether that's just, you know, uh, stereotypically working super hard or having like high technical skills, or they're typically stereotypically um, interested in firearms, interested in survivalism, interested in this, interested in that. There's a whole bunch of skill sets. Yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of skill sets that would be incredibly valuable from a community development standpoint that I think that if asked in a tactful manner, plenty of libertarian or right wing people would be more than happy to share, especially if it was pitched to them from the point of like, we want to build a stronger community. We want people to survive in disaster. We want people to survive uh, for, for any reason. Pitch it as the fucking zombie apocalypse instead of climate change. And you would have so many fucking people jumping up and signing up in order to help out. Um, and also appealing to conservatives along uh, religious lines. Um, Christianity, I know it's a mind fuck. I was raised as a Christian. I know that you had your own interesting experiences with Christianity or religion, religion in general. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some religious concepts that I think can be, be appealed to. So for instance, like charity, giving to the poor, alms, all that kind of stuff. Um, tithing can be also appealed to and basically say, listen, you guys live in this community. We might not be friends, but we want to take care of people. Let's come together. I might be a, uh, I'm shit talking. I'm thinking of Spectre when I'm saying this. I so don't think that I'm insulting you. Uh, but I, I might be a degenerate anarchist, leftist, uh, you know, pot smoking atheist, but I want to help the community. How do we do this together? Um, and I think that kind of appeal, uh, you could basically have cross political, cross cultural, you know, cross everything, um, temporary programs that would actually help people out. And then on top of that, those communications and those infrastructure and that networking and all that kind of stuff, you've built that up. Um, it's hard to do. Um, I'm not going to pretend that it's fucking easy. Oh, I'm not going to pretend that it doesn't actually involve like blood, sweat and tears. Um, but I'm not going to lie. That's the kind of shit that I'm interested in. And actually you said, sorry, uh, for being wholesome pilled and long winded. Um, you said something that's important to me that I don't think I had previously uh, considered. So I like engaging in this space. I like getting lots of subs. I like getting lots of attention. I like when people leave me comments and tweets and all that kind of bullshit. Um, but I did want to get involved in politics because I don't just want to talk about it. I want to do something. What you said that I think is incredibly important is that electoral politics is a corruptible bullshit fucking circle jerk where we waste time and energy just fucking basically trying to get to the top and then by the time you get to the top you realize that you can't change anything because you've been so compromised by all the interests that helped you get to the top so instead why don't you just be a community leader why don't you just help people with food drives yeah like like sorry, not to be I'll, not I'll to be a there, little smug not to be a little you smug. change my mind on that for yes sure. thank god see that's the thing community yeah. pilled and not state pilled um but yeah, uh, the, no, I mean, I, I, I am very happy to hear this. Let me, let me propose something that I think could bridge our very difference. You're a civic nationalist, and I consider myself a, a, a leftist with anarchist leanings. I usually describe myself as a radical queer liberationist, but I don't know. I'm pretty passionate about uh, the environment as well. But guess what? There's a simple thing that we can do that I think will bridge the gap. If I see you hungry and I have bread, I will feed you. Will you do the same for me? Of course. There you have it. That is the fundamental. Yeah. Mutual aid is indeed fundamental to human um, cooperation. And I think that that principle will guide many people in a way the state will not. If we wait for the state to, to, to pass a Green New Deal, which they don't seem capable of doing, just keep this in mind. Um, you, like if, if, uh, if you come to me hungry and, and you're like, damn, I'm really hungry and I have a little farm or whatever with maybe, maybe a little queer commune or whatever you want to say and we're smoke, smoking pot and growing our own weed and whatever and playing on the internet and whatever and you come to me hungry, I'm going to give you food. But you know who's not? Okay, but... Do you know who's not? Sorry, go ahead. The state. Mm. When, people start getting, when people start getting displaced, the, the vested interests in the state, which right now are mega corporate, whether, we, whether that will be the case in the future, I think it still will be, but they're mega corporate. They will not. We know that the police serves capital. We know that they protect property. They will kill us. They will hurt you. They will break your neck. And and so if we leave it to the state, we run two issues. One, if we don't go for a community approach, we run the risk of not, of just running out of time in general and dying from climate itself. If we leave it to, for, to fall back on the state, and this is a point that I wrote down specifically in my documents because I think it's super important. The military, the U.S. military, 
acknowledges, has acknowledged on a high level and has made preparations for the fact that climate displacement is going to be a mass massive problem. The U.S. military takes it seriously, and they're going to do what they need to do to keep their interests strong, which might not be in the interest of the average person who gets blindsided um, by climate change or simply can't escape their, their, um, their, their, their uh, circumstances. We have to be willing to say, wow, if we just leave this to fall back on the state, there will be a lot of blood. And I, I really don't want blood. I am a very peaceful person. I really would just prefer that we motivate a lot of individual people to, I don't know, buy a, buy a little plot of rural land with their, with their polycule or whatever and start growing some food, maybe keep a goat or a chicken and have some eggs and whatever, those things. And you don't have to get off the internet. You don't have to become a Luddite. This was great. I mean, I, I, I started my streaming career shortly after living in the mountains where I had minus the, the the power issues, which were climate change caused. Um, you know, I had chickens. We gathered eggs every morning. It was great. And then I would go in and I would watch, I don't know, Vosh and the majority report and and Chud Logic. Um, so like these things, you know, these aren't in conflict with each other. We just need to learn how to be more we need to be we need to reconnect with our communities. We need to actually have a push for that. We need to advocate for that. And that's what I'm doing here, I guess. Yeah, no, this is fucking based. Um, so the only thing that I will say is don't like Molotov cocktail my car because if you do that, then we're gonna have problems. Um, but <laughs> oh, oh, wait, this is a side note. I don't want. I hope this doesn't take my time. Um, I just wanted to make a small note. Um, the panel. I think you and I were both on the panel. The panel where I think um another streamer said that they they believed that they were so black pilled on the climate that they believe we needed to invade the UN. Um, I, yeah. I love that type of argument. I love the argument of people who are like, yeah, we just need to go to like eco-fascism. I'm like, wait a minute. You're saying we need to go to like, to literal like inter international war in order, in, in order to justify what, like denouncing like Greenpeace or the earth liberation front from like damaging some property. Like that's ridiculous. You're arguing for like carpet bombing nations that are populated <sighs> with people. It's such a stupid position. Yeah. And by the way, I don't support, I think that most like eco- like eco terrorist groups are really really bad at what they do and they don't do a good job but the idea that like um we would put like an invasion of another country over like a community saying um yeah sorry we are requisitioning this um like we're requisitioning this beef factory we're gonna let all the animals out or we're going to eat the animals and then we're not going to use it anymore and we'll re repurpose the space to do something else that that is supposedly more radical than invading another country in order to preserve resources which by the way is the implicit statement a lot of people have when when the temperate zone moves north and it starts encroaching into canada you don't think there's not going to be border conflict it's ridiculous of course it's going to happen we should find solutions that don't necessitate this please yeah, so um, I think the reason why this is something this is part of the reason why I came into left wing spaces in the first place um, was because my conceptual conceptualization of violence was uh, basically like I never even considered state level violence um, as like violence because I was just like, oh, well, it's sanctioned by the state, so it must be good or it must be justifiable or something like that. Um, now, I still think that there's uh, social breakdowns and cues and contextualizations, use of force, all that kind of stuff. You can call it propaganda. I, I, I think there's reasons for it. Um, but basically, at the end of the day, I think there is something to be said for the fact that, like, we we can't conceptualize state violence as this, like, nice, clean, always justified, you know, whatever, especially when negligence can lead to people's deaths, uh, basically. So uh, Great state example. level violence can be, yeah, state level violence can be incurred due to state level negligence. Um, and that's something that, you know, we could be staring down the barrel of uh, metaphorically or literally in a few decades. Yeah. And um, not just so, not just negligence, by the way, um, just flat out greed. For example, um, one of the sure. one of the best examples of this is the pipeline struggles, the water defenders. There are literally these are this is land that has been granted to a sovereign nation that our police, our FBI, our, uh, you know, Department of Homeland Security will show up and shoot people. They have killed people. They have sicked dogs on Native Americans, members of a sovereign nation that exists within our borders and, and the violence that has been meted on them to install a pipeline on behalf of a corporation. This is the sort of thing that is that is so wild. And that's one of the things I want to spend more time talking about going forward that I intend to, like, build into my content more is discussing these these areas of where the state violence is is not just in the name of like preserving order even it's just literally this corporation wants a pipeline here and we would make a ton of money off of it so we're going to do it and we're going to plow over your land we're going to let them dump poison into your water supply which makes it impossible for you to live there which makes you a climate refugee and then when you're a refugee we're not going to give you anything to survive it's literally just killing people by another name 
Yeah, so I want to... Um, if, if people oh, w- are... w- one second, Connor. Uh, just uh, uh, Dean Mama, just letting you know, um, uh, when you were talking about, uh, I think you were referencing Supreme from that panel uh, that we were all on uh, together, uh, I didn't uh, have your thing. I let you go for about 30 seconds, then I turned it back on once you like started shifting back uh, to like Ace talks about Perfect libertarianism, uh, but also about uh, in terms of time stuff. Uh, Dean Mama, you are at not you passed ten minutes. You are at nine minutes and eighteen seconds. And Connor, you are at eleven minutes and one second. So uh, just keep that in mind uh, as we go ahead. And if you want to stop being wholesome, you're welcome to fight more about state as uh, solutions. So go ahead. yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, that's uh, that that's kind of where I was going to go. So uh, if any if anybody is curious about how the other side thinks, because because basically what I, I think this is where it really gets down to. Um, the difference between left and right. I know uh, people were probably excited for me to become an ANCOM today. Uh, that's probably not going to happen. Um, so, Shame. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, all, all the lefties are so excited to Well, you don't need to become an um, ANCOM. What, Just become an eco-anarchist. Come on. <laughs> okay. But the, um, the point being that if you want to see how the other side thinks or see how the other side justifies it to itself or see the other moral paradigms, um, I talk about these things a lot um, when uh, talking about like uh, perspectives from law enforcement, perspectives from the military, perspectives um, from political power, like all that kind of stuff. This is like actually primarily my content. So even if you wanted to hate watch just to see how the other side works, that that's kind of something I'm inviting you to do, um, because I am good to go um, with um, the uh, a lot of the prescriptions when it comes to like community building, uh, community reliance redundancy security all that kind of stuff i think that's a a lot of that shit is based as fuck um the reason why you don't see me like nodding my head and being like yes we should start you know fucking fighting cops over pipelines and shit um is because there is uh maybe a certain amount of status quo warrior in me um that believes that there's basically uh builds um there's builds to the structures of violence and power and distribution and economics and all that kind of stuff and the closer you study those things um the more they can be self-justifying that doesn't mean that they're good by the way, mm. I am not making a moral statement saying that building a pipeline is good. Mm. I'm just trying to be descriptive about how power works, um, literally and uh, like literally like petroleum, um, and then also as uh, politics and security establishment. Um, so I can, I can describe something terrible that happens while still understanding the way uh, in which it occurred. Um, so what I would say here is basically, I think... Uh, because I'm an enlightened centrist and this is what I do. Um, I think in order to actually avoid climate catastrophe, I am really comfortable with my prescriptions as what's needed in order to avoid it or necessary in order, without like Ludditism becoming the fucking prescription. I think my prescriptions are actually what's going to solve the problem. That being said, as far as a way to focus your energy in the next 20 to 30 years, as these things continue to unfold, I actually very much like your prescriptions Um, about community building, security building, food, uh, uh, basically developing food security, shifting people culturally, um, shifting people on the way that they consume products, and shifting the way that uh, cities are built through uh, social and political pressure. I think that's all dope and base as fuck. So, yeah. Hell yeah. Um, One thing I will say in defense of uh, land defenders and water defenders is um, I have no problem endorsing these people's actions and resisting resisting the encroaching uh, American state. These are people who are who were not were granted by that state a a sovereign right to this land that is now being taken back from them yet again. I I think they're like I think land defenders are like the most based people who've ever resisted um like the United States power and they have every single right to defend themselves to any degree. Like I'm sorry but you don't like the level of encroachment there is just unbelievable. But see this is a thing. I I really love that you pointed out that like <clears throat> you pointed out that like something is not necessarily good but it might function in a certain way. I believe that to be true about a lot of the state. I think that the current status quo is designed to essentially force us into a, a, an accelerationist position. Our state is designed to be, um, to essentially throw the poorest people to the wolves while making sure that the richest people keep getting money and keep getting and being able to do business. And then what inevitably happens is you will see people like I've, uh, there's a number of like prominent liberals in this space. One of the reasons why I have some issues with liberals who talk about how like, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's going to end up being like eco-fascism. It's just going to, you know, it's going to be a necessity. Yeah. Because the state is designed to do that. Again, it's creating a crisis that only, that it claims only it can solve. 
by forcing, by forcing, by ignoring poor people dying, by ignoring homelessness, by ignoring climate refugees, they create a crisis that could have been avoided by earlier action that can be avoided by action to some degree right now. I think there's some of it that's already at the point where it's not going to be avoidable, unfortunately. But um, and then they will justify it by a, by further encroachment of the state. And it's interesting because you see these sorts of things. These unfold on a microcosmic level when you're looking at um, indigenous issues. This is exactly what happens. There's some sort of economic crisis. Well, we need to get the oil. And that justifies the eminent domain, which justifies going back on on treaties or, or just completely disregarding them and forcefully taking the land, sometimes killing people, often killing people or poisoning them or making them sick in the process. So and then they get it for free. So they create a crisis and then they get to take it with their overwhelming force. And this is something I really wish to avoid in the coming years, but I think is going to become all too common. And I urge Americans to become critical of state action that essentially sets up the justification for their own horrific overreach that conveniently also results in them being able to just take whatever they want. Mm. Yeah, th this is actually really interesting politically because I, I think we... Um, we view the state similarly, but we just disagree on whether or not it should be wielded or could be a force wielded for good. Um, and the, I, I want to bring this up because I would say 2016, 2017, I took the, the easiest political position for a straight white man to take, uh, which is basically libertarianism, where it's like, I, uh, you know, I don't care that, you know, you're gay, trans, smoking pot, whatever. Um, but I'm also not going to do anything to help you as you get your fucking skull craved in by other people, right? Like, that's pretty much the libertarian position. It's just like, ah, eh, you know? I mean, the fake um, libertarian so, position, yeah. But. Yeah, so <laughs> so, um, so I think the what moved me off of libertarianism, uh, trust me, I just moved, moved center. Um, but what moved me off of libertarianism was actually uh, Chris Cantwell, the crying Nazi. Um, he used to be a libertarian, and then he went authoritarian. Mm -hmm. um, and his whole argument was basically like, I was a libertarian. I tried to take uh, part in the Freedom Project, which I think was in like New Hampshire or Maine or something like that. They tried to set up like a libertarian commune. Mm -hmm. And then I just realized that people just wanted to smoke pot and fuck off and hang out in a commu uh, commune for a long time. And they didn't actually want to do anything uh, about revolutionizing society. Mm -hmm. um, so what I realized was that um, the, the power of the state is going to exist. So I either get to wield it or I get to be subject to it. And that was a that was a powerful argument to me. Because basically what ended up happening was I realized it's like, what are the chances that I'm going to revolutionize culture in order for everyone to be a libertarian? What are the chances that I'm going to revolutionize culture to the point that I'm going to convince people to leave each other alone? And then I kind of realized it's like, well, if the state's going to exist, then it's gonna, it needs to advocate uh, for interests that I care about. Now, I happen to care about liberal democracy, republicanism, constitutionalism, like all that kind of stuff. So that's the reason why I vocalize those political positions, because I want the state to represent those interests. Um, and I also don't see those necessarily as conflicting with um, some social progressive movements. I do see it as highly conflicting um, with some leftist economic positions. Um, but then that's kind of where um, th this whole thing boils down to, do you think the state can be wielded and do you think it can be wielded for good? And the answers to those, both of those is, the world is complicated and fucked up, and I think the world can be, I think the state can be wielded, and I do think it can be wielded imperfectly for good. And that's my position. See, I, I, I think there are instances where the state can be wielded for good, but I think that it's that the, the inherent structure of nation states um, tends to push people towards behaving badly. The way that, it, that, that um, these structures uh, divvy power out, the way that they're built, the, the, check, the checks and balances, which often are non-existent or are completely ignored. I mean, we know the government regularly ignores constitutional rights. These documents, um, in many cases, are, are not strong enough. And that's because they are, they are libertarian or they are freedom in name only. They put it on a piece of paper, but then the actual structures don't back these things up. Um, and so I believe we need to build those structures and not necessarily in a state lens, that we should build these things so that people can walk into them and walk into a, uh, a, a structure, an organization that, that is built with incentives towards behaving good. And the way that you do that is by not giving too much power to any single individual or single organization. This is a fundamental concept in, in anarchism um, that I think applies very well to our ecological future. Um, I really think that we have a problem with giving incredible power to to states which are are designed based on on uh, on colonial and imp and imperial um backgrounds that 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 
give a preference to landed individuals still in the United States. There's a preference given to landed individuals. Like this is, these are things, these are holdovers from monarchism that are, that represent huge inequalities in our system. And I think those need to be addressed. I don't think they're always going to be addressed. And so, yeah, I do have a problem with mm. states because I think that states build a self, a self justifying, self reinforcing um, system that at the end of the day is willing to just use might to say, um, oh yeah, well then, um, you know, this is the, this is what you mentioned with the crying Nazi guy, um, saying like, oh yeah, well, you know, I'd rather, you know, am I going to be a victim of the state or am I going to be a, you know, the wielder of the state? Well, you don't, well, he's neither. That's the funny thing. But, um, but like, you're not going to wield the state. The state is going to wield you. The state existed before you were born. It was constructed before you were born and it's, and it's, it's hallways have warped many, many people because they're designed to warp you in that way. And then also, I think there's another option. Mm -hmm. I think one of the options that you don't have to choose to be a victim of the state um, or to be a, um, a, like a subject of the state alone um, or, or a representative of the state. I believe that to steal once again from the anarchists, that you can exist in a, in a, in a position, your community can exist in a position of resistance to dominance. And that that, can, that means that you can adjust to, to face the, the attempted dominance that's being pushed on you and you neither have to be the victim um, nor be the wielder of such a thing. Now, there are some cases mm. where there will be atrocities, unfortunately, where uh, we see this now. This happens right now. I just brought it up with the pipeline where people who do stand for their rights are just bowled over. But the goal is to weaken these these massive uh, uh, authoritarian states so that they can't pull those things off. And the more societies, the more communities, the more groups that say, no, we refuse these sort of structures, these structures that warp us into subjects of an imagined whole. I think that refusing to do that is going to be essential in the future, not just, to, again, not just on a matter of, of anarchism or nationalism, but for our ecological future, because the, the state right now is going to obey the interests of the fossil fuel companies. They have and they will. And they're driving us up against a wall. And when we get to that wall, well, if we if we don't do what they want, if we don't, you know, come in and work a uh, work on a on a on a gulag or whatever, like you know, like some sort of like Dubai situation, well, then they'll just kill you, as they do, as we've seen them do increasingly over the last mm. couple of years. All right, uh, wait, wait, one second, Connor. Uh, just uh, clarifying, uh, Demon Mama, you've gotten uh, below your five minute timer. Um, you are now at three minutes and four seconds, Connor. Uh, I'll consider this your five minute warning as well, because you are at five minutes and thirty six seconds. Uh, so I will just do the shout again uh, once uh, one of you or when both of you uh, go below uh, one minute. So we're nearing the end. So just uh, maybe start choosing your words or what you want to talk about uh, more carefully and or tactically. So, uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah. So it's really interesting what you said, um, basically trying to live separate from the state and not allowing your brain to be molded by this imagined collective. Um, because I think that um, I see value in the imagined collective. And also on top of that, um, as somebody who's been a part of the tool, I've been a, a tool of the, uh, the power structure, um, but they've also given me incredible gifts, um, just gifts that I think, um, frankly, I, I would like to give uh, to all people, but not all people are responsible enough to wield. Um, so, uh, very, very specifically when I talk about this, uh, I'm basically talking about, uh, I am talking about violence. That, that is what I'm talking about. Um, the, the ability to understand first aid, firearms, combatives, you know, mixed martial arts, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's incredible. And I know it's available in the private sector, but it's not as codified. Um, it's not as driven. It's not as purpose driven. Um, and also weirdly enough, um, the be, be, by becoming a, a tool of the state, um, you also identify with other tools of the state. You become a veteran. You become a law enforcement veteran. You identify with veteran communities. So you, you basically uh, you have like this whole network of friends um, who have been wielded in similar ways, who have similar virtue, uh, similar virtues and similar values to you. Um, and you you view yourself as the the up the upholder of the the structure law and order like all that kind of stuff which um i understand for some people is buzzwords but to me they're they're lived principles um and what what's interesting to me because i i know you to be right in the fact that i think corruption will make us late for environmental catastrophe i don't know if we're going to completely miss the boat and the reason why i say that is because a state has to have a population to administer 
capitalists have to have people to sell to. Um, a uh, a planet that is completely destroyed is not a good market. Um, so while I am sure the rich and powerful can get on their golden parachutes um, or their you know floating sea submarine cities or whatever the fuck, um, basically at the same time I don't even think that they would want to live in a floating hurricane-proof sea submarine um, that is you know has to go through like a Category Seven hurricane. Um, I don't even think that they're interested in that. So I'm hoping that your pep, your pessimism, uh, while many times accurate and something that I identify with, um, I'm hoping that it's not accurate to the point that we're literally going to kill, like, I don't know, 5 billion out of 7 billion people. I hope we kill a few million and then we decide, oh, hey, this shit's real. Let's do something about it. Um, and when it comes down to uh, solutions... I think your solutions are good on the individual level. I think they're good on the communal level. And I think they're things that everybody should implement on uh, at their level, mm. because that is a level of power that you can wield right now, yes. tomorrow. It doesn't yeah. fucking matter who you are or what you are. You can start exercising that power yourself. And on top of that, there's like an emotional feedback loop. When you start exercising that power, you feel that power. And then it just becomes this uh, positive feedback loop, basically. Um, however, I still contend that uh, if we're not going to become Luddites, we're ultimately going to need a state solution to this problem. Um, yeah, and that, that's pretty much where I'm at. Um, yeah. So oh, sorry. One, one final point. Sorry. One, one final go for point. It, go for it. Go for it. Um, I wanted to point out that subsidization um, can change and should. Right now, uh, the video, uh, Hans, I, I, I linked you the video that I was talking about earlier, uh, Climate Change is a Nightmare. If you could link that for I, chat, I, I'd be yep. very appreciative. I, I already um, put it in there. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, if everybody wants to check that out, it's it's one of the best and short and succinct and comedic uh, summaries of climate change that I've seen that actually addressed a lot of my own skepticism. Um, and uh, basically, one of the stats that's brought up there is that $260 billion is currently being used to subsidize uh, the fossil fuel industry and $140 billion is being used to subsidize the green energy. We could literally flip that um, at, at the state level. And not just that, uh, but we could basically force fossil fuel companies to include CO2 production as a negative externality, uh, where they basically have to include calculus or contributions to carbon capture or plant, uh, plant uh, uh, tree planting or whatever as a part of that calculation. You're causing the fucking problem. You're profiting from the problem. Build the solution into uh, into your market. So, uh, yeah, oh, uh, there oh, were, uh, sorry, oh. uh, sorry, one second. I just really quick. I, uh, got distracted by the link. Um, Connor, you have 45 seconds left, uh, and the moment, uh, you have three minutes and one second. So, uh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So there's a couple things I wanted to touch about. Um, I recognize what you're saying about, um, about like people, like, like, like states need like a people to oversee or whatever. Well, that's true, but they don't need, uh, but th that's a very, very flexible number as we've seen. I mean, again, I re remind everyone that over the last year, we've seen 600 and almost 650,000 Americans die. And the government has barely batted an eye. Uh, 600,000 Americans, that's like almost uh, incomprehensible. I don't think that we've actually grappled with this as a society yet. How many people just died? And the government was just like, yeah, maybe we'll pass a little bit. They didn't see this as a crisis. 600,000 Americans died. Yeah, what... If, if it comes down to climate crisis, yeah, they're going to be perfectly fine with letting a couple million. And who knows who it'll be? Maybe you'll luck out. Maybe you'll be one of the people who gets to live in the future gated communities that are armed, you know, guarded by private guards or whatever. Um, but reality, the vast majority of people are not going to be that. They're going to be the ones who are getting pressed up by the water against the walls of the of the rich city. And then the, the private guards will say, hey, get the hell out of here. This isn't your property. This is, this is our border. And then they'll shoot you. Um, it's unfortunate. I don't think that that's necessarily pessimism. Um, I think... Um, also, unfortunately, I really hate to tell you this, but basically every single expert on this issue agrees that the boat has already left. We are already at the point where some, at least some degree of this is likely to happen. We need to act faster. And, uh, you do say that we can, um, you say, yeah, we could, we could choose to, to, um, to, to move green funding, to move fossil fuel subsidies over to green subsidies. Yeah, we could. We've been able to do that for a long time, and we haven't. It's not happening. Even B Biden doesn't seem interested in it, and he needs to be. That would be a first step that we should be doing now, but we're not. So in the meantime, the clock is ticking down for most of us. For the for the average person, um, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be a matter of, well, wouldn't it have been nice if the if Biden had had passed this thing? No, it's going to be, well, my house just got flooded. I have nowhere to live. 
Uh, my neighbor's house just got flooded. We have nowhere to live. We either have to go live in tents in the woods or we need to try and migrate over to the nearest city. One minute. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that the answer is plain here. We need radical environmentalism. I think that radical environmentalism is very, very well done from an eco-anarchist approach um, that doesn't require any sort of violence or anything like that. Just co just communities recognizing who they are, communicating, building inroads, sharing skills, uh, publishing free materials online, um, skill books, everything like that. There's so much resources we could do that we're not because we don't take this, the problem seriously enough. Um, and yeah, that's my position on this. So I'll use up my last 45. Um, I would say, as much as this wasn't maybe the, the sexiest, most blood, most blood sporty thing Demon Mama and I have been known for being a little bit fighty um, in the past, the reason why I appreciate this conversation is because if we were to do this on a panel, you would have used the term anarchism. I would have basically said, oh, what, you want to build this bullshit utopia? Dur -dur -dur. And that would have been like the whole fucking fight for like two hours. Uh, whereas sure. here, um, and Hans, if you'll just allow me to go over time a little bit, because I'm just being wholesome uh, filled right now. No, you both uh, can go over time. Uh, we're, we're finishing yeah. up, so you won't get your closing. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so this will basically be uh, my, my closing statement for the segment in general as well. Um, so ba basically, um, yeah, like I would say if we were on a two-hour or three-hour panel with six other guests, you would have used the term anarchism. I would have told, called you utopian. You would have called me a fucking status asshole. And that's about as far and deep as the conversation would have gotten. Whereas now, even though I think we completely disagree, and even on some levels, I might be your uh, political or institutional opponent in, in a variety of ways that could be very serious, there are still ultimately like things that we fundamentally agree on. And on top of that, things that we could work on together. The communitarian or communalist approach in order to like spread knowledge, survival knowledge, firearms knowledge, uh, agricultural knowledge... Um, build, uh, basically trying to shift people culturally slightly um, as far as their dietary or consumption habits. I think that's all fucking based. And it doesn't take 30 years. It doesn't take state action. And that is incredible. And I'm happy uh, that we arrived at that as a part of the conversation. So thank you. Yeah, likewise. I'm surprised at the things that we were able to agree on and and talk about to great length. And, and that's why I agreed to do this chess timer debate with you because I knew that uh, you would be a a interlocutor who would who would be able to benefit and mutually benefit from this particular arrangement and and i like that um i like that we were able to talk about these things in depth that we were able to explore our views on on uh issues and um yeah i mean i guess i i kind of made my closing statement before before i knew we were going to have like formal closing statements but um yeah anarchism and anarchist concepts are more based than a lot of people think um a lot of people's like only um interaction with anarchism is none of the actual like thinkers or ideas who, who who put these things together it's just kind of like this vague concept of like people who don't like um having a bedtime or whatever but that's like hardly even close to what anarchism is anarchism is a very serious philosophy that looks to analyze power balances and domination in our world and uh, i think it has a lot of especially in the age of the internet where things are naturally decentralizing in certain ways um it has a lot of potential to guide us into building structures that won't repeat the structure that won't re repeat the mistakes of the past um, so again, I'm really thankful we were able to have this conversation. Um, do I, should I do a shout out or something? I don't know. Like, I don't know how to wrap this uh, up. Yeah, you you both can shout out whatever you want. Uh, now, like I said, like time's over uh, for everything. So uh, open thing again. So yeah, uh, go ahead. Oh yeah. Um, well, my name is Demon Mama. If you like what you heard, we're probably going to talk about this a little bit more on my stream afterwards. Feel free to come by demonmama.com forward slash live. We'd love to have you. Um, and then I'm going to be doing some conservative react and, and some a little fun little surprise on our cooking segment that we're going to be doing tonight. Um, thank you so much for having me on, Hans. And thank you so much for being willing to engage in a very good faith debate. Um, Connor, I really, 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 I can't overstate how much I enjoyed this conversation. No, my, uh, my sincere pleasure. I'll shout myself out. Um, so my name is Connor. I run a YouTube channel named Counterpoints. I identify as centrist or center right. Um, and what I want to include as a part of my shout out is that a lot of anarchist principles, I know it's easy to shit out ANCAPs. I fucking hate ANCAPs myself. Um, but there's a lot of libertarians and a lot of um, ANCAPs or ANPRIMs or whatever um, who basically they do value some of the things that we talked about here, whether that's self-sufficient agriculture, whether that's being self-reliant, survival skills, firearm skills, all that kind of stuff. And as much as you might fucking hate each other, which I completely understand. Um, I would encourage um, either DSA or anarchist communes or whatever in their local communities to maybe reach out uh, if there is such a thing as like a libertarian group and say, hey, listen, 
I fucking hate your guts on this, 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 and this, mm -hmm. but why don't we build community relations? One, so uh, during climate catastrophe, we don't have to murder each other. And two, um, so maybe we could build like redundant levels of like communication, agriculture, firearms, and all that kind of stuff so our community can survive as a whole. Um, and while that might be politi politically distasteful, um, I think it's something incredibly cool that uh, if we're staring down the barrel of environmental catastrophe, could actually prevent a lot of real world violence. Um, and I, I think that's incredibly important because if, we, if we're not just talking shit on Twitch, if these are real ideas with real implications for the real world, um, then these things are important and could actually save lives going forward. So I think that's uh, super important. And then, sorry, I'm going to shout myself out again because I talked for fucking two minutes. Um, my name is Connor, I run a YouTube channel named Counterpoints. I identify as centrist or center right. Um, I'm a big fan of guns. I'm a Marine veteran, law enforcement veteran, and a statist still, even after this debate. Um, so go to YouTube, type in Counterpoints, common spelling, um, and you should be able to find me. We're, uh, you know, 7.6, 7.7, somewhere in there, and we should be breaking... Uh, you know, 8K in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, very excited. And thank, th sorry, last point. Thank you, Hans, for hosting. It was fucking awesome. Thank you, Demon Mama. I When we first interacted, I could have never imagined that we would have this conversation. The fact that we were able to without fucking killing each other is fucking awesome. So thank you. It's the Gimli, it's the Gimli and, and uh, Legolas meme. One quick thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, one, re <laughs> one, real quick, one real quick thing I wanted to, to say on that that's like not related to the debate at all. But something that I've been talking about and thinking about lately in my personal life that I think you might um, sort of appreciate um, is 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 this paranoia. Have you like I'm sure, you, you know, you, you probably had, you know, how old are you again? I'm sorry for asking, but Thir uh, at 9-11, I was like 13 or 14. OK, so you were really close. And OK, so you're not that much older than me. Um, hmm. I'm 30. You're you fucking boomers. Yeah, yeah. But but like 20, 23 games. Like, it's really funny because, like, I remember, and I mean, there is, of course, Americans have always been a little bit paranoid, but, like, I remember the pre-9-11 world, and Americans didn't fucking fear each other to the same degree that we do now. Like, um, yep. the, the, like, like there would be people with very big political differences um, that would still, like, care about each other, and, and, like, in your community, you would know them, even if they, even if you weren't close to them, even if you thought they were an asshole, if their house was on fire, you'd go and help them, and, like... Um, that's something I think that we've lost in a large level in this country, um, is that our paranoia and our, and I, I hate like saying like the political division, like it's political. I don't think it's really that. I just think that we've become so paranoid on one another that we literally think that we're just like every other American is going to like kill each other. And, and I think there are some stuff that we can analyze, but get, damn, I really hope we can overcome that paranoia because humans aren't scary. We shouldn't be scared of each other. Well, Hans, let me, sorry, I need to, I want to talk about this because I think it's important. Um, I am of the generation where when we talk about like, uh, and I know I'm only a few years older, but, um, the way that I affect, or I was affected by it, the way that I served, like all that kind of stuff, I am perpetually going to be paranoid, just law enforcement and military made me paranoid. Right. Um, I almost think it's good, um, that zoomers have come up in a different world. I almost think it's good that they didn't like experience 9-11 on a same day event or they were yeah. incredibly young at the time. Um, because while I think it's important to remember that the world can sometimes be a dangerous space, it shouldn't be this like visceral, physical, emotional reaction. Every single time you bump into something, you're like, oh, like, is, is that it? Is that the, is that the mass shooting? Is that the terrorist attack? Is yeah. it, did it finally come for me? Is this yeah. the anthrax attack? Is this yeah. the end? Um, and I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping that future generations uh, can learn to be less dicks than uh, the millennials. I, I, I am hoping. It, it doesn't look good so far, um, but they're also young. And we were doing, millennials were doing cringe shit uh, 10 years ago. So if the Zoomers need to cringe a little bit to get it out of their system, then, you know, that makes sense. Yeah. We're pretty, we're pretty cringe. But uh, I think overall, I, I really appreciate my generation's optimism. I feel like uh, we're like, it's like the meme where it's like, millennials like, man, nothing matters. And like, uh, Zoomers are like, nothing fucking matters, bro. Let's do it. Let's do my best. <laughs> And it's like, uh, but yeah, again, uh, I really appreciate uh, both of you coming. Yeah, I was like, well, fuck, I, I'm, I'm like the oldest Zoomer. Like, I am literally, like, among the cutoffs for, like, the Zoomer generation. I'm, like, Zoomer, like, zero. And I was, like, fucking four when 9-11 happened. So, like, it just completely, like, I barely remember, you know, what I, like, anything about, like, that fucking period of my life. And, like, younger kids, like, my brother who's, like, still in high school and stuff, like, they, they were born after 9-11. So, it's, like, it's just a completely different environment. And I think that's, like... Uh, I mean, I we appreciate your uh, 
millennials keeping us safe with all of your uh, doomer shit. But uh, I think uh, I, I I think it's good that our generation, by and large, is considerably more optimistic in terms of the future. I think that's like something that's uh, hopefully like going to be politically powerful. Yeah, I mean, I think. And it's a good and, thing. and you know what? God bless them. You know, I, I I hope you guys can overcome the fucking millennial malaise because uh, we're gonna we're gonna need it. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a millennial malaise. I don't know. Like, uh, I, I've been burned by a couple of major catastrophes, and uh, that has convinced me to look harder and, and try and find the solutions that I've been missing. And so, you know, I don't know. I, I love I love the—I always joke with my chat about the millennial Zoomer alliance. Um, I think that we should we should aim for that. I think that millennials can learn a lot from Zoomers, and Zoomers can learn a lot from millennials, and together we probably will do a pretty damn good job. Um, that is if the boomers don't kill us first, but we'll see. <laughs> well i'll ask them they, they don't got that much longer but uh <laughs> but uh i'm gonna i i gotta i gotta shut off soon so again thank you both so much for being here um if you like my moderation everybody uh hi my name's hans hans back here uh i am a basic uh lefty mark suck um i play i play pokemon i read the news and i honestly love this space like so much fucking much i'm gonna have like i'm gonna try and like do like a thing where like i have more people like i can like uh give like chances for like smaller creators to like do like one-on-ones in like different environments like over the course of like a saturday or something like that like just to give people uh more time because a lot because like I, I love having people in my panels but my panels are six people and like i want to make sure like to give more people opportunities to talk to each other so thank you both for uh being like the prototype for uh this kind of conversation i think it went remarkably well and i look forward to uh you know hoping to talk in the future with both of you and all sorts of stuff absolutely it was yeah. my pleasure my pleasure y'all have a great night bye good night see ya good night Uh -oh. oh my god that was so good that was so good what the heck what the heck that was so good wow that panel was amazing or not even a panel i keep calling it a panel that debate was amazing wasn't that incredible that was so good and we kept viewers and everything that was it fantastic I am so proud of my performance there. I did a lot of research for this. I had a lot of help. Oh my god, it's so good. Yeah, fucking hope pilled. This is the sort of shit that I'm like so thrilled about.